Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome from King's College London on the Strand. Slightly cloudy day for those of us in real life, but we can at least see Somerset House, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you here um, to our first attempt at a King's College George Washington University hybrid, both in person and online event. Um, it's a, a, a really a great pleasure to, to host this. Um, the date and topic were sort of serendipitously fixed so many months ago, I've lost track, uh, but it, it turns out it's been an absolutely spe spectacularly good coincidence because we have an enormous amount to talk about in the field of anti-corruption and the new UK procurement le legislative proposals. Um, so we're, we're, we're very fortunate here and we're very fortunate to have a, a fantastic panel of speakers. I'll introduce them in a moment, but let me just say a little bit about the, the history of these events and where we've come to uh, in, in public procurement. Um, King's College and George Washington University have been, been, been putting on these joint events now for a number of years. Um, before the pandemic, we had, we had an annual uh, joint event, usually in, in March, and our the last time we did this in 2019, we focused on debarment issues. Uh, and so many of the, the, the issues we discussed then remain relevant. Um, and to some extent, we're updating and moving on with that discussion, particularly in light of the UK uh, procurement legislative proposals. Um, and I believe that on um, Chris Hukin's website, Public Procurement International, which I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, and I'm sure that at some point Chris will put up the reference as well or in the in the uh, chat that the, 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 you'll find a number of the materials from our 2019 event. Um, King's College continues to be teaching actively in the field of EU public procurement law. We're teaching both in the LLM and in our, our distance learning diploma. Um, we will be continuing to teach EU public procurement law, come what may. Um, uh, although we're, we're doing that in a way which looks at a number of national um, national experiences, and perhaps the UK uh, post Brexit experiences will be one of our special national examples in the odd ways in which the EU model uh, develops. Um, and I think one of the features of, of the of the UK proposal, which we may or may not end up commenting on, is that for all the rhetoric, um, it's still quite recognisable for those of us brought up in the EU public procurement tradition. Um, we're very grateful to Chris Eukins and, and everyone at, uh, at George Washington University for all of their support and help over the years, and particularly for their support, encouragement, and occasionally nudging me uh, to get this thing up and this event up and running today. Uh, and, and we're very lucky to have that. Uh, for those of us who, 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 who are here, and if you haven't made it yet, come, come on down as soon as you can. Uh, we will be talking from on, on London time from two o'clock to about 3.30. We'll have a quick break for tea and other uh, associated matters. Uh, then at 3.45 we'll restart and then run through and then there'll be refreshments next door at about 4.30, 4.45. Um, <clears throat> so, um, where are we? Let me give a, a quick, for those of you not immersed in the UK um, public procurement law experience, um, let me make a few observations. Um, The, it was perceived as necessary, indeed it was one of the huge benefits of Brexit, supposedly, that there was going to be a bonfire of red tape. And one of the targets for this bonfire before the, uh, before, before the referendum was the public procurement legislation. And um, so we all looked forward to seeing what that was going to look like. Um, I think everyone who knew anything about public procurement law was a little bit sceptical. The, the, the obvious point was, well, you can't just get rid of public procurement law for a whole host of reasons, not least because you say you want to rejoin the WTO. Um, so that was the very short answer. Um, there were other, no doubt, other um, 
there were other comp more, more, more sophisticated reasons. So that, in a sense, that was never going to happen. Um, it is important, though, uh, to bear that in mind. Those of us, those of you from the UK, will be well well aware of it. Those of you from outside the UK may sometimes be puzzled why occasionally Albert and I twitch at various points. Um, it's and others. It's it is it is impossible to disentangle this process from its Brexit roots, even if at, it ought and sometimes does look like a purely technocratic mechanical process. The Brexit roots are are are, are very much part of how we got there. So. Post Brexit, we, we 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 it was decided to to, to put in place new procurement legislation, um, as Al, Albert Sanchez Grails next to me has already pointed out in, in on his in an article. Um, the impact assessment explains that the uh, one of the reasons why you why you had to do something is that it would have been embarrassing to someone. I'm not quite sure who, but embarrassing to someone if we hadn't changed the law. So we've changed the law because it would be embarrassing not to. Um, there we are. That was that was good. Um, <laughs> um, fortunately, I mean, if we have to have the process, fortunately, the minister in charge during the consultation process treated it as a as a as a really quite a serious project. Uh, and I think the consultation process was treated as a as a very serious project. I have one or two comments about the way it was run, but but, but you, there's some interesting material was produced. Uh, there was a lot of interesting feedback and good discussion. Um, unfortunately, that minister resigned um, a few months ago because he, of, he felt he wasn't being treated seriously. Uh, over his concerns that there had been widespread fraud in the dis in the use of loans given to support business during the pandemic. Um, he was replaced by a different person, uh, a person who is, uh, we'll come on to him in a moment, but he is, as it were, one of the prophets of Brexit. Um, he is very much, he is very deeply involved in the whole Brexit process, and I don't know whether whether it, I don't know why, um, and no, no doubt we will find out in due course. But I think it is noticeable that what we see in the proposed legislation is um, involves some unexplained rowbacks from what we saw during the consultation, some of which would seem to involve. A certain sort of deferment to a more, if I call it's not a very good adjective, but a more Brexity frame of mind. Um, we may we may have an opportunity to come over some of those things. Um, now, do we have a? Should we pull up the the slides? I think. Yeah. There we go. So there we are. There. Let me just do one full slide. Fantastic. Oh, there's me. Yes. <laughs> who needed that? Who needed, who needed that? Fantastic. Um, um, I've already mentioned uh, the impact assessment that Albert has referred to. Um, there are a number of other features which I might just mention before introducing our panel. Um, a reflection, I think, of a, of, a, of a. I don't think this process would have been running quite the same way if we, if the same minister had stayed in place. Um, there are some rather superficial remarks in some of the surrounding materials that come with the pro procurement bill as it has been produced. Um, for example, it has been suggested that. Uh, one of the key improvements is that 350 EU-derived regulations are disposed of. Um, I think the word for that is silly, because, I mean, yes, even if that was a relevant measure of anything, um, by the time all of the legislative material is produced, I 
we, I think most of us here would bet that the number will exceed 350. Somebody's um, counting, though. They yeah, stop so, at 349. So, exactly. If it's 349 regulations, then there we are. Um, one of the great drivers behind this 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 process which many of us thought was rather important was to really bring more closely within the whole regime a more integrated serious reflection on how environmental and social factors might be brought in within the process and integrated within public procurement within the UK it's continuing a process that started with the social value act back in 2012 um uh, to be completely, and I, my flippant response is, apparently you don't need to worry about that is because the equality impact assessment signed by the minister says, this is a largely technical bill regulating how public procurements are undertaken. The nature of the bill means it has li limited equality impacts, whether direct or indirect. So all of us who are planning conferences and talks about social content can save our time. Apparently it wasn't intended to have a, our, that effect. The less, uh, frivolous response to that is that just isn't what the legislation is involved it is not um it is not uh that's not not what the legislation is not a fair description of the legislation it's not purely technical um so should we should we move on um, today we're going to focus on the new legislative process from an anti-corruption process but, but looking at other, other matters as we go, um, there are obviously various lenses through which you can look at procurement law. And we have this new procurement bill and we've got a fantastic lineup. Uh, if you click on, if you, if you go to Public Procurement International uh, and um, find the program for today and click on the links, you'll find full bios for everyone, but just, describing people very briefly. In the room, we have Sue Hawley, Executive Director Spotlight for, from, for, for Spotlight on Corruption, who has been involved in um, corruption, oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> in corruption <laughs> matters and anti-corruption <laughs> concerns for about 20, 20 plus years, um, and is heavily engaged with government in trying to make them up their game. Um, Gavin Heyman, Executive Director, Open Contracting Partnership. Um, Open Contracting Partnership, many of you will know, comes from to many of the same, many of the same goals as it were, but very much from the open contracting uh, perspective and the open contracting model. And that Gavin will, will, will bring bring his insight into that. Um, Albert Sanchez Grills, I I almost say hardly needs any introduction to procurement lawyers, but he does. Uh, professor of Economic Law, University of Bristol Law School. It's a huge pleasure that Albert was able to take the train up from Bristol to join us today. Um, well, we still have trains running in this country. We may, we may, for now, may not, may not, <laughs> they, they may all come to a crashing halt um, <clears throat> fairly soon. Um, then we have... Uh, Jessica Tillotman, Assistant Dean for Government Procurement Law Studies and uh, Lecturer in, in Law at George Washington University, who has written extensively on uh, anti-corruption, exclusion and debarment issues, the issues we're covering to, today, and was giving evidence on these very issues and some of the specific issues we're covering today uh, to the United States Congress only a few weeks ago. Uh, Shope williams Alegbi, Professor and Head of Department at Stellenbosch University and Director of the African Procurement Law Unit, also joining us remotely. Um, it's a huge pleasure to have her with us. And she, of course, is the author of, and I, I did write it down so I got it right, Fighting Corruption in Public Procurement, um, one, possibly one of the first proper analyses um, of the law in the EU, certainly in English, on, on, on fighting corruption in public procurement. Uh, and a very important contribution to the topic. Um, and then my co-host today, Chris Eukins, who was supposed to be with us in person, but has been um, held up by, I think the phrase is COVID in the family. Um, and so he will be, he is also joining us remotely um, from, from the United States, uh, but he will be co-hosting and nudging me 
uh, just as vigorously from a few thousand miles as he would have been if he were in the room when I've done things wrong. I know Chris would want to apologize to all of you that he's not here, but he's with, with, with us all um, uh, electronically. So it's a huge pleasure to have Chris, uh, who's as also a professor in government procurement law at George Washington University Law School. So we've got a fantastic group. Um, let me just see, let me just to sort of take us through the, just to cover again, right, we've got uh, the agenda. So for the agenda we have, these are the sorts of topics which we will try to cover on this timetable. Um, I think I've covered the legislation. Let me do, I've, I've probably taken things a bit out of order. The short point, as we, as we've already, as I've already intimated, is that uh, a few weeks ago uh, we did have um, our finally the the draft, sorry, the the bill. Therefore, the draft law produced. Um, it was promised by the in in the Queen's speech, which is the formal introduction of new business um, for, for for the government a few weeks ago and a day or two afterwards we actually had the draft bill that is available again many of you will, will have your own personal copy of it for those who don't it's available on the public procurement international website and we'll be we've copied out some key provisions for today's discussion in the slides this is the description that was given in the queen's speech as to what it was going to say um uh I've avoided mentioning his name, but this is the minister in charge. Um, what I wanted to, before we get there, and we just wanted to show off that the date of today's discussion couldn't be more apt. Um, this, is, this bill has been introduced into, into our parliament. It's been, it's, it, it's been through the first formal processes and the second reading in the House of Lords happens today, which is an important stage because it, this is the, the, as it were, from the next stage is the, is the time at which there will be detailed discussion, the line, in principle, there, there could and should be line by line discussion of the legislation in the committee stage. Um, I don't think I've seen anything on the actual schedule for that, but that will be the next, in principle, the thing that happens next mm -hmm. um, when the legislators start to, to look at the matter seriously. Uh, this legislation will be looked at in the House of Lords, which at least means that uh, it will be dealt with by people who will be taking the time to consider this more carefully than the contents of people's cups at parties two years ago and <laughs> things like that, um, which is otherwise dominating the national discourse. Um, I wasn't going to say a huge amount um, about the procurement bill, save to note the, the sort of few general observations about it. One of the things that was supposed to happen in the legislation is that we lose um, European language. This is a very puzzling, um, in some places a rather puzzling goal because we end up losing words which may not have been our favorite words, but we got used to them. And even provisions which go out of their way to use non-European language are being referred to by government using European titles. So there's a provision which any European lawyer will see is a description of equal treatment but the word equal treatment is not used. But the government still refers to it as the equal treatment provision. And you wonder what was, I mean, you really do wonder what was the point of that. Um, um, there are it's some- It's gonna keep you busy uh, yeah, in the next few years. It will. There's gonna be lots of litigation on those Absolutely. points. So There's some deliberate steps to lose proportionality as an explicit provision, and as an explicit overarching obligation, but then it creeps back in in all sorts of other funny ways. Um, and whether it's the same or different, again, will be something that we come and talk about. Um, there are, an, I, I, I'm, there are a number of points which many of you will be aware of, but I'm going to focus on a slightly different point before moving on, and that is um, a lack of apparently thought about what the 
standard of review will be to in looking at decisions. And so most pertinently, one of the decisions we're going to be looking at a lot today is the decision to exclude a tenderer. Um, let me just take five steps back. I think most people would agree that in a European context, public procurement law is broadly speaking of a public law nature. Um, and our, our close common law cousins in Ireland took the logical step and implemented their the EU law through the public through the public law courts. Um, we chose in 1991 to implement uh, through a private law system. Um, there's no point in re-arguing that point again. We did it, it, it there were reasons for doing it. Um, and it and we got used to the problems which it which it created largely by using EU law. And the way we dealt with that was by creating the using borrowing the test of manifest error from EU law and saying, well, it doesn't matter that this is a sort of public law type test. There is, a, there is an EU law obligation not to commit manifest error. The courts here essentially, no, explicitly said that that was equivalent to the, to, the, to, the, to the comparable public law test. And so it meant that the sort of the, the private law courts here had carte blanche in applying a public law standard in a private law court. Now, to non-lawyers, you may wonder what on earth am I bothering talking about. To lawyers, these things matter a lot. Um, it matters now because we obviously don't have the EU law fudge in the middle, and we still have a private law system, private law based system, um, and we have decisions, you know, you will be, you as an authority will be deciding whether to exclude an excludable tender, tender, for example, when we come on to it. Um, what is the test for that? Is it um, a public law test of some sort of, was it a reasonable, you know, was it a reasonable decision to take? Is there some latitude to be taken? Or is it some other test? And I don't think there's any guidance in the legislation at all on how the courts are going to deal with that. Now, fine, the courts will rummage away and find a way of dealing with it, but it's not a great start um, mm -hmm. to imp important decisions on which, you know, businesses, not, not least important businesses, will be, will be, will be, will be dependent. If, if I can put you on the Please. spot on that. Do you think it's going to reduce the effectiveness of the review mechanism because of more deference to what would be commercial judgment compared to, say, Wensbury tests? Or... Yes. Okay. So basically, I will, litigation I think, for two years and there again. I think there will be, I think, I suspect that we will have two or three years where there will be a dialogue amongst judges as to what the right test should be, unless we fix this. Okay. Because we don't have a manifest, unless one of the early, I mean, the one, the one thing to be said is that at least the early cases will be in a, probably will, will be in the courts that deal with public procurement. And it may be that the judges just say, well, it's not explicitly dealt with, but they must have meant, they must have meant that we apply the manifest error test or something. So at least there is a sort of a, a notion of not making errors. Because if we don't have the manifest error test, it's very hard to know what, as you say, there's, there's a risk that, that there's a sort of, broad deference to all judgments and unless you've actually infringed fair treatment equal treatment transparency um there isn't there isn't there isn't actually a breach at all mm -hmm. but also even even fair treatment because there's a clause we'll get there but about the difference in treatment being justified by different situations yeah and the stringency of that is not the same in the public law and private law i, no. I gather no so okay. absolutely well, I've just, you know, exactly. I mean, I've just had a couple of cases about equal treatment in a non-procurement setting, and it's not e not an easy area to argue because the courts say, well, we're not in a very, we're not, the courts are not in a good place to judge equal treatment there because how many, how many other situations, they don't have evidence about all of these other situations. So they say, well, how do we compare with all of these other situations that you're, which you're talking about? It's not, um, and it is a bit different, isn't it? When you're talking about equal treatment in the context of a tender evaluation, at least you know that you're probably just talking about the other tenders. Yep. Whereas if you're excluding a tenderer, are you just talking about the tenderers in this tender or are you looking at the whole industry or um, 
So there's a whole range of possible problems, I think, yep. which need a bit of thought through. Thank you, sure. through. That's a good point. Um, maybe the short answer is we get, we rely on transparency, but this will plug into some of Gavin's concerns. It may be that we end up saying it's all to do with transparency um, and that there's an obligation pursuant to transparency to run the process in accordance with the rules you set. And you don't, but again, that doesn't really deal with exclusion. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I, I, I'm going to park it, drop it as a problem which hasn't been dealt with. Um, there are many other points like that along the way, but that seems to be quite an important one. Um, one of the key changes in all of the, oops, 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 thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll let you go if you're, you're better than me. Um, scope and exceptions. I'm not going to talk a great deal about scope and exceptions. The, the key thing about scope at the moment is that it covers the, the proposed legislation covers the whole United Kingdom, with the exception of um, with a whole load of exceptions, <laughs> basically, which raise all sorts of interesting devolution questions. And I'm not sure that they've yet been thought through. So Scottish bodies are the, the, the legislation covers Scotland, but Scottish bodies are excluded. Um, which makes sense, but I, if you follow <laughs> follow our devolution, but I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> um, the legislation covers Northern Ireland, but there's no reference to the fact that, um, at least in part, Northern Irish procurement has to be subject to EU law still pursuant to the protocol. And I don't see how that is reflected at all in the legislation. There's a reference to the increasing independence of the Welsh procurement system, but I'm again, I'm not sure that has uh, been seriously thought through. Um, and Wales will have its own national policy statement. Uh, Wales will have its own national policy statement, indeed. Um, um, the this slide, well, I've, there's the reference to Scottish authorities is only one of many exclusions. Um, the Chris like wanted me to point out that the Queen is excluded in her personal capacity, um, which I suppose would be inconvenient. But she doesn't carry money around with her. How many contracts? Anyway, let's let's leave that as a sort of a thought experiment as to when she would be procuring things in her personal capacity. Anyway, uh, but no, she, she she's not covered. Uh, the, perhaps the more serious point is, is to to remind ourselves that at least for many years after the original pro, uh, regime, the House of Commons also claimed to be exempt from the, um, from the regime. So um, good that we have avoided that. Um, the whole process is intended to pursue these key goals. Um, I'm not gonna repeat them all, but um, interestingly, I mean, those are the goals which are stated, but but as I said, th throughout all of this, there are all sorts of odd trade and Brexit related issues which pop up all over the place, and um, which frankly, it might have been a bit more transparent in a different way, led to at least recognize that as being part of the goal. Of course, trade, as I've, the evidence I gave to the to Parliament uh, last year, to some extent, the trade goal in our legislation was the sort of original sin that diverted us away from all these key goals. But you can't abandon the trade issues. They are, in fact, the reason why the government has been compelled to have this legislation. And it, the, 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 the trade goal is one of the key drivers, but also key complications in a lot of we're going to talk, what we're going to talk about. I have talked far too much, um, and we're going, we're going to now jump in and talk about the topics of the day. Um, we're, focusing on anti-corruption, but we're doing that through the exclusion and debarment mechanism. Um, and I thought what, what, what we thought would be most useful um, would be to start from the perspective of people who actually know how procedures like this work. Because although we've had exclusion processes in our legislation now, since the 19, here in the UK, since, since 1991, um, they are very, very rarely used and this, these, proceed, these, these new legislative uh, procedures are very similar 
to those which exist in the United States, which have been in operation with a whole body of case law since the, the Second World War. So it seemed that a useful point would be to start with perhaps Jessica and Chris between you, if you wanted to start kicking off with your discussion, and we will come in and ask you questions as to what is it we've done to ourselves and where are we going to go with it, um, if that's okay with you. No, delighted to, and thank you very much. Um, actually, can we go back, Laura? Can we go back a couple slides to the to the goals right there? Perfect. Yeah, and I just I clarified it. So, in a tradition of uh, Mark Twain and uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, my job today is is to be the ignorant American and say, uh, "Whoa, what does all this mean?" As in an attempt to to pull out some of the important elements of this. And I just want to spend a moment on this uh, on the goals. Um, this is something that Gavin and I have discussed, and and goal three is um, one of the, uh, these are the key goals, um, the, to share information for the purpose of allowing suppliers and others to understand the authorities, procurement policies and decisions. Gavin, this seems to me like a goal that's rooted in the 1990s and, and, and ironically rooted in the European Union. The European Union has always focused in terms of transparency on the, on the transparency between the suppliers and the government because that key communication is important for European and economic integration, but it's not the 21st century. The 21st century, I think, is about transparency to everyone. Do, do you have a perspective on this goal and how it might be improved in, in the bill? Yes, I think one of the key things I was so excited about, as well as the single rule book, was uh, that vision that was in the green paper they were saying about end-to-end -end transparency across the commercial cycle of contracts. So from the planning through the award and tender and then the implementation of contracts, even looking at their performance. Now, there's such a, an important vision. And then within chapter six, the green paper, they were talking about how you have that digitization that will underpin that, the common data standard that will allow us for the first time a sort of single source of truth or at least a relatively coherent source of truth or complete accurate records of what happened in public procurement, which would lead to like better oversight and spending. It is worth saying in the impact assessment, that's probably the biggest gain from the bill that it claims. It says that this will save about, I think, uh, these 200 millions worth of savings and net present value over 10 years. So there's that end-to-end -end vision in the green paper. You are absolutely right, Chris, that it's quite striking that actually in the, there's no principles, even though um, there were originally going to be principles of procurement, they've gone to statutory objectives. And in there, there's just this one about supplying information to the marketplace, right? That's very sensible, totally agree with it. And then just acting at, and being seen to act with integrity. But it doesn't say anything about that end-to-end -end vision of transparency and digitization that was so compelling. So that's perhaps the most striking uh, miss that I see in terms of the green paper vision and mapping it over to the bill. If I can chip in there, Chris, um, I, I think what the green paper uh, promised after there have been some discussion on what should be a principle, what should be a goal, is to clarify that and to clearly include in the bill goals and principles as separate categories, but there are just no principles. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so that's the problem that, that we are left with here, that, that there are these goals, some, which, some of which you could read to mean things, because you, you could read the third goal as meaning the transparency goal. Mm -hmm. um, you could read the first one, if, if you are of my persuasion as saying, well, it requires competition as the mechanism to deliver value for money. But this is just willful reading, because we don't have those general principles. And I think that's that's one of the strange things, especially when the Green Paper promised those principles and they are not in the bill, which makes you wonder what happened. So, so what's happening along, uh, along the way? And I think we will keep going back to that issue. We, we don't have a clear mapping of the bill against the response to the Green Paper. So we don't really know how policy is trying to be translated into legislation, which of course means that for well-meaning interpretations in line with the green paper, the bill as it stands is not a big problem because it, it, it doesn't prohibit transparency, for example. It doesn't prohibit mandating competition, but it could also be turned into something very opaque or very non-competitive. So, so just, just for the audience, some of the remarks that we'll make or the criticisms will be about things that are not there that we expected to be there because the green paper sort of promised it. And, and, and I think that that's, from a broader context perspective, very difficult to understand. I completely agree. And there's such a, um, 
I guess, a strong reliance on secondary regulations, right? There's so many other instruments that we brought in to clarify what the bill means here. You could say the bill is something, a skeleton, so the regulations really retaining powers that will then be deployed in the sort of secondary regulations. It's hard to say how you might achieve that. So obviously, we very much hope the government still has that end-to-end -end digital transparency in mind, right? But um, we can't say from this. And the problem is, if a future government chose to rescind those provisions, there would be nothing in the primary legislation that kind of underpins and defends them. So that's, I guess, our real way. Yeah, I should have made that point in the introduction, actually, that, that it is important that, that uh, this is very much a skeleton piece of legislation because it will not uh, certainly and particularly in the areas we're talking about it will not work without a lot of procedural secondary legislation which does not yet exist so a lot of a lot of the thing quite a lot often today we will end up saying well <clears throat> it's good it, it is what it is as far as it goes yeah can i shop, add a sorry. quick yeah, sorry. please sue carry on no shop it with super clean shop it do you want you wanted to jump in Yes, yes, I do. So I want to ask a, a question maybe to the to the British lawyers. Is there any reason why the word transparency is actually not used in the bill? Because I found found that obviously in the goals that are, are up front there in the bill, very, very strange, because that's a word that we already associate with procurement. We know what it means to, you know, to a certain extent, but it's as if they were deliberately shying away from that word. But that word is not an EU word. It's, it's an English word. So I don't know if, if anyone knows the background context to why that's missing. Do, do, do you want to have kind of a go at that, Gavin? Uh, I defer to the legal experts. I have a, a theory, but I'll share, but let's hear from I experts. I fear that I, I'm going to impute the worst possible explanation, which is it's just a bit too French. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Gavin? So the, the feedback I've heard from people who are close to drafting the bill was one of the challenges they had with the council was how do you convert those transparency obligations, let's call them that, into yeah, specific measurable provisions that are testable and you either have complied with your transparency obligation or not. So now the OECD has some very clear guidance on different elements of transparency in public procurement. I wouldn't say they are all in this bill and there's you know, that sort of uh, a general sense of being able to understand the government's spending priorities, for example, is not clearly referenced in the objectives of the bill or anything else. So, so to my mind, there's a real opportunity to better draft this and put more of those more crunchy, cogent transparency provisions in. I think you're absolutely right, Sophie, that it's in most other countries' procurement legislation. So it's quite striking, particularly given what happened over COVID procurement and the VIP lanes and everything else, that it isn't framed as a much more kind of public interest transparency provision myself. I mean, I suspect part of it may be that there's an element of um, frustration that transparency has been used a lot by us litigators in the last 25 years as the can opener to expand the and deepen the meaning of public procurement law. And one way of preventing, of taking that can opener away is to identify specific transparency obligations. You must produce this notice on this day and this notice will produce these things. Alternatively, the notice must produce the things that we specify in a regulation which the minister will change from day to day. Um, <clears throat> <coughs> and it supposedly takes away from us the ability, as we have done, to be, to be fair, is to say, and judges have enthusiastically on the whole followed along with it, to say, well, trans the whole, I mean, as, as one, one of the judges did a, who did a lot of this, he, he were, used to say, isn't the whole point of public procurement law is you, um, you say what you'll do, you do what you say, and then you explain what you did. Mm -hmm. um, and that enabled him in his, in, 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 as being his sort of thumbnail sketch, which enabled him to open up all sorts of things because you could, you could, you could, you could take that in as a very powerful, rather homely principle to open up all sorts of aspects of public yeah. mm -hmm. This really narrows it down, I think. And, and by putting the, some of these other points into 11.1 in, in, the, in the formats, in the, the must have the, the authority must have regard to the importance of format. The authority can simply say in their documents, we had we thought about value for money and public and all of these things, and it 
difficult then for the court to get far behind some of this. Hmm. Not impossible, but difficult. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, I have a, an, an anecdotal sort of rumors that the other thing is that this is a strongly defense infused bill because it has to absorb the defense regulations. And that's why, for example, we see things like reports never being published or disclosed even to the uh, entities that are affected by those reports. So, so I think that there is, in addition to the issue that comes from mitigation, there's also the issue of, well, if it has to be a regime for everyone, instead of leveling up, which is an expression the government likes, mm -hmm. we just went for the minimum that we had to ensure under the regs for defense and try to pre preserve as much as that standard as we can throughout. And, and I think that's why there is this issue with open clauses about what the contracting authorities consider or the, the views that they reach and, and exclusions of, um, uh, if, if you look at it, for example, all of the exclusions from disclosure are based on either national security interests or commercial um, issues. There is nothing about law enforcement. There is nothing about non-disclosure for other strategic reasons. So I think it's a very defense heavy, strangely bill because of this amalgamation of regulations uh, that, that Michael was referring to in the beginning. So it's it's a bit of a strange Frankenstein effect from bringing everything together, but maybe I'm, I'm just confused about this. I doubt it. Sue. <laughs> I had uh, mainly really kind of questions for the panel since this is less my area. Uh, but one is about, one is to raise a point that the um, Freedom of Information campaign has been raising, which is that, you know, they often called for uh, the information held by public sector contractors to be subject to freedom of information. And so I guess it's a question of how much you think um, that's something that should be in there. I mean, I think we're quite focused on, you know, there is this window to get it tightened up as it goes through Parliament. So what are the really concrete changes that could actually really help? Uh, so that was one. The other was really a question about commercial confidentiality. Because just even looking at it in the kind of context of the exclusion stuff and, and the debarment register, I mean, it's so broad, the definition of commercial confidentiality, that I can't see when we come on to debarment how a debarment report would ever get published. <laughs> because, you know, someone's going to say, well, it prejudices my commercial interests. And so I just, I just sort of wanted to raise those as kind of issues which kind of touch to the principle of transparency, but maybe a bit... Yeah, well, they're very, can I, can they're I jump very in on that one? Oh, yeah, sorry. Jessica, I'm not Jessica, sure if I'm supposed to be raising my hand. Chopé was much more polite than me, so maybe I Jessica, should jump, jump in. in. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a really important uh, to American way, a slippery slope when we are talking about commercial. It could impact my commerciality. Shouldn't it impact your, your commerciality? It should. I mean, one of the things that we use in the United States for due diligence uh, for companies in the private sector, um, many companies with robust compliance programs will consider a company's exclusion by government uh, to be a factor um, that could potentially exclude a commercial partner. Um, you know, we call it the corporate death penalty in the United States for a reason, because the minute you're excluded in the United States, not only does it cut off your future government revenue streams, you can't get a loan. You could lose licenses, your commercial partners won't work with you, state and local governments won't work with you, international governments won't work with you. And there's a reason for that because you pose a risk to many people, maybe not always. I mean, you can explain away why you've been excluded and maybe somebody will buy that, you know, buy that. But for many people, I think the idea that you would hide it, um, I think is incredibly problematic because there's this growing ecosystem that relies on the transparency of these decisions to protect all sorts of people, not just governments. So I, I think that we have to be really careful. The other thing I would <clears throat> warn on the transparency front is it's very short-sighted to, uh, to hide some of this. Now, some of the information I understand for national security reasons, and you have to be worried about that being too much of a blanket excuse, but, but when you start hiding information or limiting the use of this information too restrictively, it has a cascading effect on the way you can use this data for, for growing anti-corruption purposes. So I'll give you a, a, a key example in the United States. The United States is, is experimenting, many of the, the government agencies and, and, and are experimenting right now with the use of artificial intelligence to um, do things like re review voluminous amounts of past performance data uh, from contractors 
Uh, so that I'll give you an example. If I'm a, you know, a very, very large government contractor, I will have thousands and thousands of past performance evaluations from my government customers. And so what has happened is when a human reviews them, oftentimes because there's so much to sift through manually, um, you know, and it, it could be completely unrelated to the project at hand, they'll go to the companies <clears throat> and they'll say, just select you no know, three sample past performance reviews or X number past performance reviews for us to look at um, so that we can get a better sense of, of your performance. And of course, what does a company do? They cherry pick the best evaluations um, so that it, it, it looks good for the company. And so it's not a particular a particularly reliable way to do this. One of the agencies, the Department of Homeland Security is currently um, experimenting with the use of a bot to, to sift through the, all this voluminous past performance data so that it can pick the most relevant and the most useful and provide the best you know, comprehensive summary of the past performance data. One of the challenges that they're experiencing is that the, the regulations prohibit them from sharing this past performance data with third parties, which is the companies that have the AI, you know, the bots to do this work. And so it artificially constrains it and there's a rule pending in the United States to remedy this. I use this only as an example that when you're too artificially narrow in, in, in the way you deal with transparency, it has repercussions that you would never even envision at the outset. Can I, yeah, please. So I, I, I think those are very good points. I just wanted to address the issue of the freedom of information um, and I think there are two things to, to be mindful of. The first one is that in the green paper originally published in December 2020 already in paragraph 167, the government was very clear that they would not change the standards under the Freedom of Information Act. So whatever happened with transparency under the future procurement bill should be in line with the Freedom of Information. And specifically, they said only data which would be required to be made available under the Freedom of Information Act or other environmental rules that apply would be publishable. So, so that will remain the substantive standard, which probably means that when we read things like paragraph six of uh, section 58, which is the one about publishing reports leading to debarment, and it is said that um, it's possible to prevent the publication of information that is sensitive uh, commercial information where there is an overriding public interest in not disclosing, we need to go back to freedom of information. And another of the, of, of the peculiarities in in the UK is that, for example, under freedom of information legislation, it's been determined that the commercial interest of the public authority, not only that of the commercial operators, is to be published as a, as a it's, it's to be protected as, as a relevant public interest for non-disclosure, which means, for example, that the contracting authority could say, I'm not even going to go down the route of whether disclosure is going to affect the commercial interest of the economic operators. I'm just going to say disclosure affects my interest when I want to run another tender for the same or, or, a, or a different thing. And it's very hard to challenge unless I'm, I, I have missed something. So, so it would be really a complete game changer for the procurement bill to adopt a standard that departs from Freedom of Information Act. And, and from the perspective of red tape, it would be a very problematic one because the government would say, well, we're massively increasing now the red tape burden on the contracting authorities if we go beyond what the Freedom of, Inform of Information Act requires. So, so from that perspective, I would think this is almost a lost battle because if the Freedom of Information Act doesn't get reformed and it doesn't look like there are any plans, whatever the procurement bill says is going to be read through Freedom of Information Act eyes. So, so maybe it's one where I wouldn't put all of my energy. Um, I, I actually, I actually have a completely different perspective, uh, Albert. The, that, and this goes back to Gavin's point about the need for open contracting, open standards, which is that the procurement is unique because it has such such dramatic economic impacts on the economy of the United Kingdom. If you, and this is an area where the European Commission is arguably well ahead of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom has to be mindful of that. The European Union, and we're going to be talking about debarment and exclusion primarily to today, but there's there the debarment and exclusion are just the tip of the iceberg on a very broad spectrum of qualification information. The European Commission is moving aggressively to making that qualification information open, accessible, and open and accessible to trading partners. If you look at what the European Commission is doing vis-a-vis -vis the, the Canada, 
under the CETA, on the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, European Commission and Canada are setting up so that European vendors and Canadian vendors will essentially be, in many ways, pre-qualified in the two markets. So if the, if the United Kingdom, if the government of the United Kingdom is constrained in what it makes open and transparent and accessible in terms of qualification information, not just exclusion, but all qualification information, it can't basically step into the fast lane where it's opening up markets abroad for United Kingdom firms because they're essentially pre-qualified because of the qualification systems can speak to each other. So I think there is a solid argument for Gavin and for Sue and other advocates of transparency to be made. Look, this isn't just about us pushing for transparency. This is about opening up opportunities for the United Kingdom internationally. I just think, so just so expanding on just the several different elements here, but uh, so there's the, the vendor performance and and in the bill I've, I've lost the um term now on my computer but um there's effectively reports and it was all depend on the secondary requirements for those but effectively to publish reports on vendor performance and that could be a very powerful tool to unlock better performance management by authorities so there's something that's quite intriguing in the bill that's really positive also on the confidentiality provisions there's a a bit of equivocation it does say there's a kind of overwhelming public interest to redact information. One of the reasons you can redact information other than um, national security interest is commercial confidentiality, but then the actual bar set for what constitutes commercial confidentiality is a little bit perhaps weaker rather than again overwhelming evidence of, of you know, the need to redact the information. It's just uh, you know, like a, the balance of evidence that's commercially confidential or suspicion of commercial confidentiality. I'll look up the wording in a second. So there's a need again. I think almost a bit of better drafting of this bill will tighten some of those provisions and make it more intentional about what it's trying to achieve, which could be that green paper vision that could be genuinely powerful with our end-to-end data. So that's why I find it myself in intrigued by the bill, but also wanting to tighten and specify some of those terms. So you have this kind of provision for the much stronger information regime. And I, I love your vision, Chris, of, as you said, pre-qualification and the much more seamless trade with partners, which would be really powerful if it could be achieved. Maybe just before we move on, on to exclusion, let me just make a couple of observations about confidentiality. That is, I think it is it is important. It's a, it's disappointing that we don't have anything that is going to you know, break the, the current lo locked situation we have around commercial confidentiality yeah. in public procurement. Um, and some people have said, "Well, you know, can't the courts fix it?" And the short answer is uh, not easily, not unless someone as a civil society entity, as a sort of a situation that Gavin is talking about, is able to come in and test what is or is not commercially confidential. Um, because in the context of any procurement dispute, uh, there simply isn't enough time within the context of the dispute to resolve these matters and so there becomes uh, it's not it's, it's not unfair to call it a conspiracy it's not that it's just that you the, every the one thing everyone agrees in these cases they have to be done quickly so you don't have let's take four weeks out and let's work out what is and is not really confidential and so you end up fighting these cases in a way which where, where the amount of information that gets into the public domain is necessarily limited because that's the, the easier way to get, get the case to trial quickly than have to spend a sort of six, four to six weeks in parallel litigation about whose secrets are really secret and for how long. Um, you find a good case for us, Michael. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's, we're actually, that's actually an issue, Michael, that we're fighting about here or, or reviewing here in the United States. We're working on a study for the Defense Department on how to make bid challenges a more effective management tool for the Defense Department and for other agencies here in the federal government. And what's becoming apparent as we walk through it, Michael, we're, and we're interviewing people, stakeholders across the community, what's becoming clear is that the internal data on the government on, on bid challenges is oftentimes really bad, partly because stakeholders inside the government don't want to share information about their mistakes. 
And so what's becoming apparent is that if we're going to have a better, if bid challenges, bid protests, remedies are going to be a better management tool for senior decision makers in the government, much of the transparency has to come from the outside. Much of the information has to come from the outside. So we're actually moving very aggressively towards a recommendation that the materials from the bid challenges be instant, be automatically presumptively available. That, the, for instance, the as a matter of course, our thousands of bid challenges are the materials and pleadings are redacted, that those redacted materials be made public because that will then will make those bid challenges, which typically are about the procurements, the 0.3% of procurements that are the most serious problems. It'll make information about those problems more readily available to managers. So the transparency, the joke is the transparency is the gift that keeps giving. What Gavin and Sue are pushing for is so important because we can't fully foresee the benefits of that transparency down the road. Um, we could stick on this topic for another couple of hours, probably. But, <laughs> but we should it? go on. We should go on. Should we keep going? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, no, 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 sorry, you, you, I'm leaving you. There was a couple of comments in the chat, by the way, that people were asking specific questions from the audience. So it's yeah, I've got oh, sorry. a couple of them. I'm not Great. sure I have all of them. But Chris was going to sort of try and gather a few of them together, and we might may come back quickly. But I was conscious that we probably need to plow on. Otherwise, we'll never actually get to what we were going to cover. <laughs> um, exclusion and debarment. Should we start with the um, with section 54, or sorry, clause 54? It's, well, it's only a bill, so it's still only a clause, not a section. Um, I mean, the starting premise for this, we'll, a few, in a few slides time, we have section, clause 26, which I've already, already referred to, which is one of the key decisions, which sets out the fact that an authority cannot, cannot in, entertain a bid from an excluded supplier and may not, or may decide not to entertain a bid from an excludable supplier. Again, that's a, that's a slight simplification, simplification of the language. Uh, these look a little bit similar to things that anyone who's done, EU, who's done EU public procurement law may recognize these lists and this language a little bit. This hasn't, they haven't tried very hard to get away from EU law here. Um, who would like to kick off the discussion about this? Um, maybe Java. Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to start or Jessica? Hello. No? I, I can. Well, Albert, go I ahead, and I, I, Albert, I'll follow you. Go for it. Okay. No, I, I guess the that I mean, what, once you read the clauses, but once you read the regimes, what I think you realize is that there are no two regimes. There's only one regime which is on the possibility to kick out or boot an economic operator. Um, whether we talk about mandatory or discretionary exclusion grounds, there are common elements. So the first common element is that um, it's a closed list, so you cannot do it for something that is not included in the list in principle, but there are open-ended terms, in particular to do with professional misconduct. Um, the second one is that both of them are susceptible of disapplication, um, basically be it under self-cleaning or be it under material change of circumstances, whether that means something different. Um, and also both of them can lead to an inclusion in the department list. So, so there's no such thing as, as two substantive categories of grounds in the bill. And talking about excluded or excludable creates lots of confusion and it's basically a hangover from European law. In European law, it has reasons for that, and we can go back to that, basically about the competence that the European Union has to mandate things to happen in the member states. But under, under a pure British approach, this is an unnecessary overcomplication. And, and what I think hides the fact that even for very egregious crimes, of which an economic operator has been finally convicted, there is a way out um, through either self-cleaning or through an overriding public interest in awarding a contract to the excluded supplier. So excluded never means excluded. It means potentially excluded, which then means excludable. And if we want to avoid a word salad, um, this should be fixed. However, as Sue <laughs> mentioned in one of the um, sort of pre-session meetings, th this would basically be a rewrite of the bill and we may not see that. So, so it's one of those that we may have to learn to live with. 
um, again, it's going to keep you busy. Lots of litigation yeah. I see on that. But uh, it, how does this sound to experts not, not within the UK zeitgeist? So I'm really curious to know what what Shope and, and Jessica make of this. I, I have to agree with you. This seems needlessly confusing. Um, and look, I will say on one hand, um, giving the freedom for uh, officials to be able to avoid exclusion, you know, due to self-cleaning or public interest, I, I think is is key. More importantly, self-cleaning, I've written extensively on how important I think it is to empower um, officials, um, particularly in, in countries that, you know, don't have massive corruption issues. I'm not saying that, you know, any country is immune from corruption, but that corruption isn't so overwhelming that it completely taints kind of the civil service when it comes to these things. I think empowering officials to have the discretion to make those decision ultimately incentivizes companies to engage in self-cleaning. I think companies and systems where um, debarment is so extreme and, and, la and, and officials lack the discretion to make those types of judgments and ultimately becomes almost an automatic application depending on a contractor's activities. Um, I think it's bad. I think it disincentivizes self-reporting. I think it disincentivizes um, companies from engaging in uh, remediation um, and in compliance enhancements. Um, but it has to be, you know, applied fairly. It has to be applied evenly. It has to be a robust process. Um, so I, I think um, the idea of something becoming more discretionary is also consistent with the OECD's most recent set of recommendations um, to associated with the anti-bribery convention, which point to a company's debarment rules and, and or a country's debarment rules and, and suggest that mitigation be uh, and, and incorporated into the way that a country conducts its debarments. Because as we know, if you needlessly exclude a company that's engaged in types of self-cleaning, you're actually reducing competition and, and it sets off a whole other parade of horribles. So I, I like the idea that this ultimately means more flexibility, but yeah, I mean, if I'm looking at it, I find it utterly confusing. Um, I think that one of the benefits of a, um, at least in the United States, the debarment system can be formal, like we see in the Environmental Protection Agency, where it almost has a kind of, I don't want to say a court-like structure, but it has a much more formal legal process structure um, to informal uh, in the United States, uh, where you can just call up an agency suspension and debarment official or contracting official and actually begin a conversation about uh, uh, your compliance measures um, because we ultimately view this as a business decision. So getting to a place where governments can more readily view this as, um, as a business decision, as um, a matter of risk and not as a, just a follow on form of punishment, I think is all a, is a, good, is a good approach. But my concern here is that it's so confusing that it almost necessitates, no offense, Michael, you hiring a lawyer, um, to to wade through this um, and 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 makes it more formalistic and it moves away from that kind of informal business decision. Just a few thoughts. We've got a forest of of different hands in different places um, at random. Shopping. Okay. Hi. Thanks. Um, so for me, I, um, unpopular opinion first. The the bill in terms of its exclusion or department um, process, it has everything that you would want to see in a good department system. So you have your grounds, you have due process, um, you have knowing who the disqualifying or the, the debarring entities are. They treat, they, they deal with related persons with subcontractors and, and what they call, I think, associated contractors. Um, the self-cleaning measures are there. The Jessica has talked about them. There's a procedure for removing um, contractors from the debarment list. You have a debarment list, <laughs> which is something we didn't have before. Um, and they also talk about termination of contracts where where is uh, a supplier, where a ground for exclusion subsequently arises after a contract has been awarded. So a lot of the stuff that you want to see in a debarment system is there. But um, I think Jessica has just said this, the bill is so poorly drafted that it's it, all these things are there, but they're so confusing as to how they would actually work. Um, I, 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 so I, I teach in South Africa where English is not anyone's um, home language or native language. And so we're always, we're always cognizant of that. So I was thinking, was this drafted by someone who's a native speaker of English or by someone whose native tongue is not English? Because it's, 
the language is just um, obtuse to, 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 in my view. So I think it'll be very difficult to, to actually implement in practice. I mean, I, I've, I've written on this, um, you know, a lot and I, I couldn't understand a lot of it. I couldn't understand whether we have a one-off exclusion system and a debarment system that then goes on for longer. So is a contractor going to be excluded if there's a discretionary ground or a mandatory ground, ground just from that particular contract? Or does that automatically mean they go onto a list and then they're there for a number of years or or whatever? So I couldn't I couldn't work that out. Um, and then I couldn't work out and I, I spent hours on this. I, I mean, well, maybe not hours, but some time. <laughs> um, <laughs> I couldn't understand what the investigations in Section 57 are for, um, because they seem to suggest that that's the start of a debarment process. But you've already been debarred under Section 26 to 28. So what's happening in Section 57? Is it an appeals process? Um, I, I, I didn't, I didn't understand it. Um, so I, I hope colleagues would be able to give me some answers because I, you know, I, I sat with it and the more I read it, the, the less I understood it. Um, but I think in, in, in substance, everything is there, but so badly written, so, so badly written that, um, I'm hoping that going through the committee process, we will have, um, you know, people who would see this and think, you know, this doesn't work the way it's written and rewrite or redraft. Um, but what you would want to see is there, but in very poor, poor form. So I think that's where I'll stop. Both Sue and Chris want to jump in, but it's sort of respecting natural justice. Shall we let the drafts, the drafts people of the legislation speak for themselves by quickly running through the slides, give a bit more context to what Shopper was just saying, because I think so Shopper's made a number of important points there. It's probably just worth we just canter through the provisions for those who haven't yet indulged and sort of bathed themselves in this language. Um, as Shopee indicates, it may not repay greatly the study, um, and the legislation is available online. So the starting point for this provision is Clause 54, which defines excluded and excludable. Um, and Albert's point is well made. Yeah, fine, but, but why? What's the difference? And excludable, if you're going to get rid of get rid of European words. You don't have to introduce a horrible English word like excludable, um, which I thought you can choose in the dictionary until now, but there we are. Um, the next, you to make um, to understand that provision, you have to go to the list, which is in a schedule of the different exclusion grounds. Again, many of you will recognize some of these, um, some, some of these exclusion grounds. Some of them may be more important than others. They include um, a number of, issues which we, which might broadly fall within the, under the heading of um of corruption there are a number of oddities why you know competition or infringements are in are in both places um with slightly different categories um there is the perennial exam question which my students have to answer every year about how non-uk non offenses and and doings and how you take account of of events that happened outside the UK, as so many of them do. Um, there are a number of any number of points to be picked up here. I just pick up one randomly because it picks up but when Gavin quite rightly pointed put, picked me up on the um, on Welsh policy. Uh, labour market misconduct is discretionary, um, which is a, interesting because um, you might have thought it was pretty serious because one of the things that the Welsh are very fix, fixed on quite rightly is companies that are blacklisting people for union membership. And there's some new Welsh guidance specifically on that. Why is that discretionary, not mandatory? I mean, that's frank, or maybe that, where is it? I, I, I couldn't work it out. It's not quite modern slavery, but it's it's not, not, not good either. Um, just to go back to make this a key provision on both sides of the definition, therefore, why have we bothered splitting it anyway, is, is this event likely to occur again? This is a, this is a new notion. I suppose it might have been part of the self-cleaning discussion previously, and it's now spelt out. Um, did we need all this? Is this clear? Anyway, there we are. There's 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 clause fifty-five, which which sets out the fact that you have to look at whether something's likely to occur again. And obviously, this is a well. It'll. <clears throat> I'm sure that many of us acting for for private clients and bidders will be uh, using clause clause fifty-five. Let's see what, where that goes. Um, this is, when you've been through that, you, this is the decision, which I've referred to a couple of times, this is the decision which it leads to. 
do I do I do I keep this person in or not? Um, bear in mind that um, the decision also refers to associated suppliers, so that will include subcontractors. So there's now a, a huge, a really a very big pool of people that you have to look at. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, that's extended in, in clause 28 with explicit references to data on subcontractors. Um, I don't, and then and then we have a get into a debarment. And I just thought we should just quickly just that that is not the whole. That, that's not all the text that Shopee has uh, referred to critically, um, but at least I I highlight some of them. Um, Sue, back to you. Sorry. Yeah, so as someone who's campaigned for a debarment register for about 15 years in the UK, I was like, hooray, <laughs> we finally got a debarment register. And, and then I kind of talked to Albert and <laughs> looked a little bit at the bill. And I am wondering whether there will ever be anything on this de debarment register. And, and the, you know, the purpose in the, um, the expiratory notes is to make contracting authorities more confident to exclude suppliers but as Shopee says you know I mean this is going to be any you know trainee lawyers listening in get into the procurement business because this is going to be highly lucrative and a, a lot of work coming uh, your way Michael <laughs> mm. yeah. um, I mean I think the key thing says this thing about uh, where is it likely to occur again I think we should not be referring to that as a self-cleaning clause. I think this is really, really problematic and it has to come out or be completely reframed because I'll give you an example from another area where we've done work which relates to uh, corporate behavior. So if a prosecutor uh, convicts a company, um, you know, there is no route in the UK courts to be able to impose a corporate probation officer, uh, a monitor on um, a company and everyone says well don't worry we've got serious organized prevention orders it's fine they can do that but the test for a, a SOCPA as they're called is that you have to prove that this is likely to reoccur so prosecutors have never used a SOCPA to go after a corporate um, and get them to impose a, a monitorship in the court so I can't see why you know anyone looking at this how would you as a contracting authority prove uh, that this is it's, it's like a theoretical that this is likely to happen again so it seems to me such a high bar that and you know I'll be interested in the lawyers I, I'm not a lawyer but I like to read mm -hmm. legislation uh, get around that so it seems to me that needs to be completely reframed so that we keep the self-cleaning because you obviously do need what Jessica's talking about you do need ways to allow companies to remediate you need to encourage them to do that you know, um, but if if you're making it a bar that the whatever the grounds of the exclusion might happen again, you're getting into a realm that is really, really problematic. Um, I mean, the, to, to show Pace's point about, you know, how the debarment exclusion regimes work or going to fit together, they seem to me actually to be two different systems. Um, and this is actually really quite interesting. Like, the one for the minister in the debarment list is almost its own separate administrative procedure. Um, and they, they can take into account what comes from contracting authorities, but they don't have to. Um, and so that in itself is quite interesting. And interestingly for the debarment procedure, they don't have the same things as section 55, mm -hmm. as you've pointed out, Albert, which I thought was a good thing given how poorly drafted and worrying section 55 is. So you could have a minister deciding this company is actually not worth tendering with, you know, where the contracting authority has, has said it is. Um, so I think you could get quite a lot of conflict actually happening between them and they're almost like parallel systems um, and that will need to be resolved. Uh, sorry, nearly done, if I can just get a few couple more points. And one of them is about what's not on the list in schedule six and seven. Um, I mean, for us, it's, you know, completely incomprehensible why you have a failure to prevent tax evasion, but not the failure to prevent bribery, when failure to prevent bribery is the main corporate offence in the Bribery Act. That seems kind of completely arbitrary. Um, the other is, you know, it's got the proceeds of Crime Act for money laundering, but it doesn't have uh, criminal breaches of the money laundering uh, regulations, which, you know, as we've seen from a recent big fine of NatWest, you know, there you know, it is a criminal route for money laundering convictions. 
Um, nothing on sanctions and sanctions evasion or companies that have been designated. So all the controversy around Gazprom subsidiaries and whether councils can get out of contracts with Gazprom subsidiaries, you know, isn't really being resolved by this legislation. And finally, and this is something I'd be interested in the US perspective on, you know, in the UK, there are so few convictions, frankly, for quite a lot of these offences that convictions is way too far down the line. So what happens if a contracting authority has the evidence, you know, and it's very clear, or there's a police investigation that can share the evidence, you know, and there's a whole, you know, due process thing to protect a supplier, but, but they can't really act on it. So they know this is a dodgy supplier. Actually, by the time they're convicted, they'll have had to clean up their act, but this is the most risky when they're dodgy. And the only thing that it allows in Schedule 7 for is if there's modern slavery, which is completely arbitrary. Why modern slavery and not fraud and uh, tax evasion? So um, there, there, there we go. That's my main mm. overview. Just tell me in the government's own review by the Department of Communities of uh, local procurement fraud found that 25% of authorities had experienced it in the year. I think it was 2018 they were looking at. So it's quite striking. This is a genuine problem for councils and, and others to deal with so sue so, so, uh jessica to, 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 i was just going to respond to that last thing that that so so one of the the key aspects within the united states uh debarment system is the availability of what we refer to as fact-based debarments this is where our suspension and debarment officials um are able to make exclusion determinations uh based on um without needing a conviction. Um, and then I will just say at the outset for, for those of us joining us outside the United States who are less familiar, in the United States, our bases for debarment are as broad as corruption ranging to grossly incompetent performance. So it, it we have wide ranging ability to exclude uh, risky contractors from our system. And, and so the fact-based debarment is huge because it does allow our suspension and debarment officials to exclude companies and individuals at that time and without the necessity of some sort of a conviction. Um, and it does provide you know, robust due process. I mean, to me, I will say suspension and debarment officials um, don't love doing fact-based debarments. You know, they're not as easy. They could be more controversial. It sets them up for greater risk of a lawsuit. Um, but they're they're incredibly important component of our system, and and what that relies on is not just empowering the suspension and debarment officials to actually uh, have the ability to to take fact-based action, but it relies on the ecosystem around them to be, provide this information. So if I'm a, a suspension and debarment official in the United States, I could you know, send a letter to a contractor because I read an article in the newspaper that said, you, know, you did X or you did Y, or there's just allegations at this point. I have that ability to send what we, it's, it's, it doesn't trigger suspension, it doesn't trigger a debarment, but an informal letter would be referred to them as show cause letters. So we have the ability to do that. They could get information from what our, our watchdogs, our inspectors general. So there could be an internal investigation within the agency. There could be a whistleblowing complaint. There could be some sort of information in the Fed, but they can really get that information from anywhere. So it, it relies on a series of other bases obtaining it, whether it's voluntary disclosure, encouraging people to come forward, encouraging companies to come forward. There's a mandatory disclosure rule within our government that requires companies to disclose when they have credible evidence of violations, and that could, that could lead to consideration of exclusion. Again, it could be the newspaper, it could be just a, a whistleblower tip to um, a watchdog agency or even the suspension and debarment officials. So I agree with Sue that when you artificially narrow not only the bases for which you can exclude a company, you, you remove that power from your government officials to, to keep the, the system safe. Um, uh, and you're creating um, you know, procedural hurdles when you have to rely on convictions. I mean, everyone knows that, that especially when it comes to companies, it's incredibly difficult to secure these, um, which is why more governments are turning to settlement agreements, particularly when we're dealing with white collar crime. So I wholeheartedly support um, everything that you just said. Chris, you had your hand up.
Yeah, thank you, Michael. Michael, could you go back to slide 13? And I just want to I want to stress a few things and, and pick up where Jessica was Jessica's comments. So so first of all, there's so much here that's exactly like the US system. And in some ways for the Americans on the on the, the call, it can be an illusory familiarity. So we have to be very careful, of course, going forward, assuming that we don't understand what we're seeing based on our own experience. But what I do have to say that there's so much that would help inform an understanding this based on the US experience as Jessica has been referring to. So first of all, and I was the guy who put these slides together. I, I, I use these images of this contracting authority official because in our US debates about this process, there's two steps to the process. A contracting official makes a first decision. And that's what really this is about. The, Section 54 is about the contracting official. It's called the contracting authority, but in our world is one person. And I suspect that in the United Kingdom as well, it's going to be one person who has to make these decisions. It's somebody who's earning between 40 and 100,000 pounds a year, and it has to make really hard decisions as a contract, as a loan contracting official. And we're very careful about that when we decide, when we talk about what burdens we're going to put on that person, because that person has an overwhelming number of other responsibilities and may not have the support that a, a minister of the crown, who's in the second stage of the process, the department list, has. So we're very careful about that division. I'm working on a separate study regarding labor violations and whether or not labor violations should be a mandatory source, exactly the issue you raised, whether or not labor violations should be a mandatory source of debarment. And we really focus, we pivot on this question about, are we putting too much pressure on this guy, this one person who has to do so much? Um, the, the, the big thing about this is if you look at the purple language likely to occur again, this is a miracle for us. This is a debate I've been having back and forth with various partners internationally for years. Should debarment be about punishing evil acts or should debarment be a risk-based approach? What the United Kingdom has done here is it has embraced a risk-based approach. This is, this is much like the UK Anti-Bribery Act of 2010. The UK Anti-Bribery Act of 2010 fell, came in behind the OECD guidance, came in behind the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, and it broke open the dam. And suddenly with the UK Bribery Act, compliance measures became accepted worldwide. I think the U, this UK bill is going to break open the dam and make everybody say, you know what? It's right. The debarment should be a risk-based analysis. It's not about punishing evildoers. Really interesting next step development in debarment overall. If you can go to the next slide, please, just quickly. Oh, Joe, sorry, Chris. Sorry, was... Yeah, the, I, I'm sorry, one more slide. I apologize. Michael, I completely agree with you. Circumstances like that, and I completely agree with Sue. I think you just got the words wrong, okay? It's the, the analysis. We kind of, like Jessica and I looked at this, and wow, this is really interesting. Circumstances likely to occur again. That feels like it might be the right test, but it's somehow not the right test. The right test, I think, for both the, the, both of the contracting official and for the debarring official, the minister of the crown, okay? The question is, has the contractor taken measures to stamp out the performance risk and the reputational risk that the government faces? Because if you look at this very first thing, whether the, the A, 1A, okay, what the United Kingdom has done has imported the concept of victim compensation, a very important and recognized part of the European directive. You can't get back into the European public markets unless you pay the victim's compensation. That's buried in the US regime. It really isn't played out. The Europeans brought it front and center that you do have to pay victim's compensation, an incredibly important human rights provision. And the UK government has here brought it front and center back into the analysis. But that has nothing to do with circumstances. If you pay the victims, that doesn't tell you whether or not the circumstances are likely to occur again. But it does go to whether or not the performance risk or, more importantly, the reputational risk to the government has been stamped out. I think that's the proper analysis, not whether or not the circumstances are likely to occur again. But again, the fact that the contracting authority and or the debarring official, the minister of the crown, makes this analysis means that it's a risk-based analysis. It's kind of, it's a huge breakthrough. If we could just go back one slide quickly on this, on the labor discretionary, and, and Michael said, why is this discretionary? Why is it mandatory? 
What we found is we do have, for instance, under the Service Contract Act, which requires, in essence, that union rates be paid under service contracts. The Service Contract Act does call for mandatory debarment if you don't follow the Service Contract Act. Literally less than 20 contractors, there are thousands of cases, but literally less than 20 contractors have been debarred under the Service Contract Act. And this goes back to the fact that debarment is a business decision. It is a weighing of various concerns. Maybe, maybe you don't want to eliminate a competitor from marketplace. Maybe it's a central competitor. Maybe they've, like, this is the SNC-Lavalin case in, in Canada. Maybe they've done a decent job at remedying what was wrong. All these things come into a very complicated business decision, and that is arguably why labor market misconduct would be discretion. That's, by the way, where we're going in the United States. It's becoming clear that a mandatory system of debarment for labor law violations doesn't really work. We have to make it discretionary, but we have to put, as Sue would point out, we have to push more pressure on the contracting authorities and on the debarring officials to actually do their job and debar those who engage in these type of flagrant, the type of situations that Gavin was referring to and Michael were, was referring to, flagrant violations of labor law. Make it discretionary, but with teeth. Thanks very much, Michael. Uh, do you want to... Yeah, I, I just wanted to maybe go one step back and, and maybe justify why I call it the self-cleaning provision, but I'm not doing the same thing as the government, calling it the EU thing, but not meaning it. I think if, if we look at um, what this provision is trying to do, and basically, it's trying to change what is now in Regulation 57, I believe, 8 or 9 of the public contract regulations, but then getting rid of the EU bits that we find annoying and including a little bit more of flexibility. And, and I think it might be too much to read a risk-based approach once you read it that way, right? Because basically what we have here is an obligation to comply with the three conditions that the EU regime imposes for self-cleaning, which is to have paid the compensation, to have taken organizational matters, and then the EU requires to have collaborated with the investigating authority, which for some weird reason, it's been removed from here and moved into something else as a separate ground for exclusion. And then um, if, if we go to the um, slide on section 55, what we have included are things that probably British practitioners would like to take into account. For example, you haven't cleaned your act yet, but you promise you will, right? So 55.1c. Okay, let me take that into account. Or let me take that into account that a lot of time has passed since you engaged in the misconduct. Although these grounds are already subjected to a look back period. So if I can take into account things you've done in the last three or five years, depending on the grounds, and that's the only difference in regime that I could find in the shadows, then what is the point of allowing me to say, oh, it's already been four years? Well, it's within the look back period. So why would that be relevant? Or, oh, let me take into account any other evidence, whatever that means. So if, if you strip the last three, which actually I think should go because they give excessive discretion on something that is forward looking and is gonna be difficult to verify or on something that is very open-ended and could be the object of lobbying or simply bullying, but a very strong legal team against a very under-resourced um, contracting authority. What we have in 55.1 now, A and B, is pretty much the same thing we have in 57.8, I believe. The, 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 where, where things change, is going back to 54, is that this has reversed the, the burden of proof. So uh, under the EU regime, the one that has to demonstrate that they have self-cleaned is the economic operator. Whereas here under 54, the one that has to demonstrate that things are likely to occur again is the contracting authority. So, so th there is a shift here that, for example, this is an amendment that might be worth trying to push to say, well, it's um, somebody is excluded or excludable. If a mandatory exclusion or a, or a discussion exclusion ground applies, unless the economic operator demonstrates or, or proves to the satisfaction of the contracting authority, whatever language you want to use, that it's not likely to occur again. Because otherwise, this is something that looks like the contracting authority should investigate. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry for moving you back and forth, but if we go then back to 55.3, it looks like there's also a proportionality test on what the contracting authority should be bothered to look at or what information they can bother <laughs> the economic operators to provide because it depends on the nature and complexity of the procurement and the financial resources. So basically, if you're engaging in um, uh, not yet convicted for um, modern slavery, but it's a relatively low value contract, say 200,000 pounds, I may not even bother investigating because it would breach this proportionality requirement. So again, section three should go. 
mm. right? If we want to be serious. But then if, if we get rid of all of these new flexibilities, we go back to the EU regime. And the EU regime is not risk-based. It's simply about saying either you have paid your penalty and your price already, or you're out. So, so you want to go back in the game, pay, pay the compensation, fire the culprits, and do compliance. So, so that, that's why I'm a little bit reluctant to, to see a, a significant shift in, in what the legislation is trying to do, unless the culture really changes. If, if, you, if you leave this in the hands of those that are very indoctrinated in how the EU regime works, we're not gonna see a more risk-based approach to say, I'm just making a commercial decision on whether I believe you have changed your organization sufficiently. But, but, but you know, again, it's open for interpretation and, and I couldn't but stress again uh, what, what Shopee said, that this is obscure um, to say the least. I promised you all a break three minutes ago. Um, the, the conversation will continue in, and before we do that, uh, we'll try and gather together um, comments from the chat and, and maybe draw a few people forward. I'm just going to ask two questions really about, about Clause 55. Um, will it really survive the legislative process? Um, politicians are much more worried about their reputational damage, aren't they, than anything else. And they don't really care whether it's likely to occur again. What they don't want is a story in the Daily Mail saying that they're contracting with, some, with someone who did a bad thing in the past. Whether it happens again in the future is, is the least of their concerns. It just looks bad in the Daily Mail because it happened. Um, will it survive? Quest secondly, um, is, is the fact that, that you've entered into a deferred prosecution agreement inevitably a factor which is should or is decisive one way or the other, other on, on, on in the exercise of this discretion question mark and I said two things but I meant three <laughs> um and I I just wonder why why not just redraft clause 26 if you if you if you're going to make this all risk-based in this way which I see the arguments if you're going to do that, why not abandon excluded and excludable, that would have the virtue of getting rid of a horrible word, and just say everything, you, you may be excluded for any of these, a factor in deciding whether or not you may, will be excluded is whether it's likely to occur again. And you would, that is exactly what clause 26 currently says. Why not just say it that way and say what you mean, as, as you say, Albert, rather than raising this false hope that anything is in fact excluded, um, because no nothing is excluded, in fact, on the, on the current legislation. And I'm not, I'm going to deny anyone the immediate prospect of a response to that by saying, let's come back in nine minutes time at 3.45. Okay. Okay, welcome back, everyone. We managed to get ourselves a cup of tea. I hope you're all appropriately refreshed. Um, we won't, we've got stronger stuff coming afterwards for those who want. Um, I sort of stopped the conversation halfway through, um, just just as, as it was break time. Uh, can I? I was going to try and pull a few people forward to talk about things. Can you just go down and get, um, to Abby's question? Yeah. Can make it bigger. About make it, yeah. yeah. Um, rather than try and pull people forward into the panel, which um, uh, which will I will probably manage to close down the whole meeting. Which would rather if I, if I try that. Um, Abby Simple has, a, I think, a, a, an interesting thought experiment for us. Um, if we're ready for it. Uh, other than breach of contract and poor performance, there doesn't appear to be any grounds which address. Oh, sorry. Yes. The, the question is. So it's sort of a yes. Uh, she starts. What Albert says about reversing the burden of proof is important. Has anyone applied the Carillion test to the new exclusion provisions? If these provisions had been in place, would Carillion have been excluded prior to causing huge problems for the public sector when they failed? And then she continues. Other than breach of contract and poor performance, there doesn't appear to be any grounds which express, addresses financial instability as opposed to insolvency bankruptcy. Admittedly, this is seldom black and white, but given the re relatively recent memory of Carillion, one might expect an exclusion grounds which reflects 
that type of situation. Um, does anyone want to reflect um, here on, on Abby's thought experiment? I, I think what, what this points to is, is um, change of circumstances. So, so I think one of the rigidities in the procurement systems is that you, you look at the qualitative selection criteria at a specific time. If you want to be as recent as possible, you do it at the time of award pretty much, but that's it, that's the end of the story. There's no continued follow-ups. Um, there is something in the, in, in the bill that tries to address that, for example, in dynamic markets, where you can be kicked out during the duration of the dynamic market or during the duration of a framework, if you become excludable, even if you weren't at the time of being awarded the, the framework or included in the dynamic market, but th there is no such dynamic element in the um, award of, of standard contracts if we want. So, so I guess the issue here is how, how much discretion have the contracting authorities to engage in continuous qualitative selection that falls short of exclusion? Because what, what, what I would think is that writing in the, the Carillion Clause, so for example, saying you can be excluded if you're in a financially unstable situation, is, is that it's going to be very difficult to assess, um, especially because financial information is rarely available in real time and it has a high audit cost and, and so on. So maybe it's about writing into legislation the regime about strategic providers, for example, saying, well, if you're a provider above a specific amount of money in a contract, or if you aggregate a number of contracts, then what we will do is have an ongoing assessment of your continued ability or your continued, what the, I guess the US they would call responsiveness. So whether you continue to meet the, select, the selection criteria or whether you create any specific risk I see that, that Chris is already um, reacting to that. So maybe Chris, you want to, to chip in here. No, just that they, they're, they're, again, in terms of echoes between the US system and, and the bill, um, I, I, I understand Abby's concern. I think it's a great concern and it's a great point. In the US system, there is a process for interrogation. That's what section 55 is really about. Under 9.4, subpart 9.1, there's a process for the contracting officer to interrogate the contract, their prospective contractor to be see whether or not they're in our term is responsibility, qualified as responsibility. And one of the one of the elements of the interrogation can be uh, whether or not they have sufficient financial resources to perform. I know to start on Caridian, I mean Caridian was hugely influential on it in terms of the transparency provision, certainly in the green paper, because obviously when Caridian failed, no one knew what the exposure was. Up and down the country, there was this desperate scrambling around in town halls and basements and across the treasury to understand the extent of the exposure. You're talking about, I think, one of the second largest construction company in the country, 450 contracts in government, of which about 10 were publicly available and easily found on contracts finders. So I think that that digital transparency and uh, information provision piece was very striking. Hence why I hope to see it much stronger in the in the primary regs. So it's not so much about that. I know that obviously there's audit failings in Quillian's case as well, which was part of the problem that even what it was telling the public markets was perhaps a question of information on reflection. Um, okay. Could I answer I something so. you, yes. um, which is slightly different, unless we want to keep going. No, no, keep, the, please, please. the questions you raised is before tea, actually, Michael because it reminded me that there were a couple of other things um, that are not here, which we kind of, they said there would be in the uh, green paper. So one is DPAs as a discretionary grounds, uh, which does seem, you know, at odds with the Serco DPA judgment, actually, that it's not here, that, you know, the judge there thought, you know, that is an important thing for procurement um, authorities to know whether a company has had been subject to a DPA. Uh, so that does seem an omission, actually, to us. And the other is about um, the mandatory um, exclusion if you don't provide beneficial ownership information, which seems to have gone completely, but I don't know whether anyone's bottomed out, whether it's hidden somewhere else. Or... I haven't found it, but that was supposed to be to explain to people that was, there's obviously considerable sensitivity and it's grown in the last couple of months here that no one knows who owns anything. Mm -hmm. um, and that's particularly the post- post February 24th, uh, a particular concern, but it's been an ongoing concern that, that trying to, the, the idea of trying to understand 
who, who, what companies were related to others was a, just a basic day-to-day -day problem on, often. Um, I'm not sure why that hasn't been followed up. Um, I'm on the DPA point, um, and I've got no. I've, this is not based on any informed discussion. This is just me wondering that, that it occurred to me that, that if this, if the ledger, there's probably an interest in the in the government avoiding doing anything that might encourage a judge giving judgment sorry, two steps back deferred prosecution re agreements under our re regime have to be validated by a judge and there has to be a an open judgment which is published explaining why that deferred prosecution agreement is agreed to um, and I'm sure the government would want to avoid losing control in letting the judge say at the end, as you might do it in a normal sentencing process. And I rather think these people should be kept out of the market for whatever. I'm sure it'd be put in more judicial sort of language than that. Um, you know, you do, do, because and then maybe there's a, just a concern that they'd be actually handing, as it were, a punishment power to a judge. I don't know. Although actually in practice, all the DPAs have done the opposite. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, they've done exactly the opposite. Yeah. But I could suggest a deference to, well, and part, that was what the circuit judgment as well was about. Was that like I would not make this decision, and the judge said, if I thought it was going to impact on a procurement, yeah. was the, um, discretion. Hitherto, so, I mean, hitherto judges have, de have demonstrated that they, they just don't like DP, but they just don't like the whole concept of that thing. I mean, although they're beginning to get come more to terms with it, but yeah, sorry. No, so it was just answering the second part of the question about the beneficial ownership. It's, it's so, so it's really interesting because in section 88, right, there's provision for acquiring certain information you share in a particular way, including through a specified online system, and then making arrangements to establish and operate online system for the purpose of sharing information. So I read that as laying out some of the the very very broad shape of hopefully what will be the more data driven approach. The government's looking at whether it brings in, for example, a single point of supplier registration. In that, that would potentially capture beneficial ownership both from UK companies, which presumably would talk direct to companies' house, and uh, yeah, like a potential foreign vendors who would register their credentials there. So there's there's something because at the same time as this is going on, there's a kind of digital project to build some of this architecture, and I would bring the two together more so they more clearly reference each other. So my understanding from the people in the cabinet office is that that will be actually a major efficiency saving, and that all kind of contracts will get registered there. That may well speak to some of the debarment provisions why you've got this kind of two tier approach. If this is the Secretary of State that says you can't be on this register, and then council should look at that and the facts around certain cases to make an on judgment. But long story short. I would bring the digital vision and the legal vision better together. I think that's the, the key thing. But, it, but I understand that things like benefit ownership may be dealt with in that information provision for contractors to register at the single, um, single point of like you know, registration, which could be a huge efficiency saving done well, right? Because it means you don't have to keep re-registering all those different authorities. You've got one set of credentials that are verified and trusted, which would be, I guess, similar handing over to... Uh, amazing folks from George Washington and elsewhere, similar to how the US does it with um, it, its yeah, structures related to federal contracting. Sorry, I'm just wanting to see, I just wanted to see where we're going. Um, time marching on. We've got so many fantastic slides which Chris has prepared for us. He's given us an agenda which will keep us going till 10 o'clock tonight. Um, I, and, and we've got a number of questions which really pick us up more on performance and um, remedies. And I hope we can try and reach that stage of the discussion. Um, I was proposing to, to, to move on, therefore. We've started on the debarment process and the launch. Do we want to say anything more about the debarment process? We've, we've covered an awful lot of it here. Um, you've just touched, um, Gavin, on some of the oddities of it. Do we need to, do, do, I think we've probably covered enough on, on that for the moment, have we, or unless there's anything that remained? Um, well, I, I think yes. it, it may be on a later slide, but um, I had questions about the interaction of the system. So linked to what Sue was saying before, these are two track systems. 
Um, what happens if the decisions are contradictory? So what happens if a contracting authority excludes an excludable or excluded supplier, refers this for investigation to Section 57, and investigation concludes, no, they were not excludable. It's not clear. It's not clear. And also, um, is anybody going to give effect to that exclusion initially until investigation is completed and you're included in the department list or not? Um, I, th I think that there are lots of procedural issues that need to be thought through, and maybe it doesn't make sense to have these two-stage investigations. If you want to have a, a truly fully centralized system, maybe you can just take it away from the contracting authority say, if you are thinking about excluding, refer it, you'll have to wait, but then wait for the central investigation and then everybody's on the same page. And it's the problem of being the first one to spot the crook. Um, but, but otherwise we're gonna have some problems going forward. And I think that the fear of damages for exclusion that is then proven or, or, or found to be otherwise is gonna deter lots of contracting authorities from, from applying it, at least in the initial stages of the, of the running of the act. Yeah, um, well, I, perhaps too often when I've seen bits like that in the legislation, which I don't understand, I've assumed that somehow it's going to be resolved in regulations. But I mean, the problem you've just identified uh, but it seems to be, I don't see how you can resolve it. It's a conflict between the two primary two provisions of primary. Well, it's a tension between the operation of two provisions of primary legislation. And I don't see how that's going to be how that can be resolved. But uh, maybe maybe someone has worked out the answer to that. I don't know. I mean, from the legislation, it seems that the only bit of additional regulation will be about the field process for the debarment register. I don't see anywhere else. I, and in fact, I noticed that in the green paper they promised statutory guidance for contracting authorities on how to operate exclusions and I don't see that here um, but I think I mean we've always argued that you do need to centralize the exclusion uh, and debarment decisions to get consistency and and this doesn't seem to really do either it seems to just create like you know these parallel um, regimes but <clears throat> um, Chris did you want to say anything uh, no. no, just the, 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 there was an effort a few years ago to decentralize the debarment list, uh, to, excuse me, to over to to re-centralize and over-centralize the U.S. debarment list so that it would be handled by one board in the U.S. government, which is really where, where the United Kingdom is going. Um, that was resisted mightily by the agencies. The agencies wanted to retain authority to make a business decision on debarment. So the system we have here is that the agencies each have their own debarring officials and those debarring officials will coordinate with each other through a committee, it's called the Interagency Suspension Debarment Committee, but each agency has its own debarment function. So we're actually very curious about this UK approach because it, it does what the, United, what the Americans didn't do. It centralizes it in, in one minister. And we're, we're curious to see which approach seems to work better in the long run. Jessica? I, I I would jump in and just say that um, there was an attempt to do it through legislation, um, a bill that failed. Um, the SDOs would argue um, that that by centralizing it, you eliminate the specific expertise of the SDO of a particular agency that might have a better understanding of some of the legal issues um, associated with it. Um, it's certainly, I think, um, one of the one of the problems that we still continue to have in the United States is that we have fairly robust and active um, agencies, and then we have those that barely use their own debarment um, powers. Um, the, the, the word in the United States we use is more mature agencies and less mature. So that's the the nice way we've been describing this disparity. Um, and and the problem is is that because the United States lacks transparency into how we use our system. Yes, we publish names of exclusions. We don't provide the bases for it. Um, there's very little insight into it. Um, we only get these kind of high level data points um, in our, um, they're supposed to be annual reports, but we're a, a year behind um, from our interagency suspension and department committee. Um, we don't really have insight into why um, agencies aren't uh, using it. It could be that they're just simply not using the power afforded to them. It could be that they haven't even considered it. One of the things that we now track in the United States are things like referrals um, so that we can see if an, if a, an SDO has been given a matter to consider. Um, because one of the things you also want to be careful about when you track data like this is you don't want to associate the notion 
of more debarments or more exclusions, meaning a better system. It, that's not the way it works because there be many, will be many instances where an official considers exclusion then ultimately determines it's not in the government's interest to take that action. So having a more robust uh, data point for outsiders, whether it's the public, it's the media, it's civil society to analyze, to see was there a referral, was there consideration is, is ultimately what I think every debarment system should aspire to so that we can more actively determine whether or not it's an effective system. Just high level statistics or, or, or governments that hide this data. Um, you know, in the Canada, they, they uh, purportedly release names of companies, although they only have three people on their list and it's been that way for years now. Um, they don't release the names of individuals. Not having this data point doesn't allow us to see whether the system's actively working well. And frankly, it penalizes those agencies that are actively using it because they get swept up in this, this, this characterization of the system as inactive because we're looking at kind of baseline data. So um, anything that brings more sunlight into it, um, I think is helpful. I don't know if necessarily centralization is the answer, though obviously coordination is something that we we, we smartly turned two years ago in the United States, um, but I'm, I will bang the table repeatedly on the need for transparency and debarment systems. Um, I think any desire to protect companies from having their names associated with some sort of blacklist is outweighed by the need for the public to better assess whether or not the system's effective. Can I just pick up a, thank you, Jessica. Can I just pick up a question which Caroline Nicholas has raised, which is about, the challenge procedures to debarment decisions. And Caroline's just got me doing something I had not done before, which is to search for the word appeal in the regulations. There's only two contexts in which the word appeal is raised. One is in the context of an appeal against a decision to be excluded as being a utility that ought not to be covered because you know all the same sort of stuff as we're used to in the EU system, um, because you're a private, you're, you're commit, you're operating commercially, private, that sort of thing, um, and the, the the challenge to the debarment decision is described as an appeal in in section 66, 61, 461, a supplier may appeal. Now that would uh, more than imply, what's the word? It would lead to a strong uh, indication that that process could, well, it could involve a re-examination of the basis of the decision. Now, there's it's the sort of the word appeal. There's a whole load of stuff about what appeal means in English procedural law. Um, it isn't just judicial review. Review there. It's more than did. Did the minister get it wrong? It's not just was the minister acting within his general discretion, um, and it, in, in, uh, there maybe there, there'll be more guidance in the in the underlying um, legislation when it comes out. Uh, but it does come back to a point which I hope I'll be able to pick up on in light of some of the comments made by various people in the chat, which I made when I was talking about the the, the manifest error test and so on. Um, it is it is interesting. That this is one place where the word appeal is is used. There's um, no suggestion anywhere else, for example, that when you challenge a bid decision, that you are appealing the decision. You could have said that. I mean, no one, I'm not aware of systems where that is done, but you you could describe a bid challenge as an appeal. That language has not been used, and it, it would lead to a different uh, notion of what the bid challenge was about. Um, maybe we'll come back to that if we have time later on. Um, um, thank you, Lord. Oh, well done. You're ahead of me while I'm even while I'm talking. Well done. We had a whole load of great questions from Albert at this point, but um, and pages of them. I think we've probably covered a lot of them, haven't we? Um, they're here anyway. Uh, should we move on to conflicts of interest, which is just as ghastly and thorny a topic as exclusion <laughs> of development? Um, conflicts of interest. Um, the, 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 yes, we'll set up there. So, this is a, an obligation to 
take all on the contracting authority to take all, all reasonable steps to identify, et cetera, et cetera, conflicts of interest and potential conflicts of interest. And that concept is defined. I think that our com commentators from the United States might look at this definition and see this as not being as sophisticated as their own uh, legislative provision. Uh, maybe I might go to Chris or Jessica to starting by telling us where, where this is getting where this is getting wrong, where, where, how we've got on from, off from the wrong foot, as it were. Jessica, do you want to do you want to start? Sure. Um, I mean, look, I, I think, first of all, addressing conflicts of interest, big, <laughs> kind of important. Um, so um, I think the idea that it would even attempt to address uh, this is important. Um, in the United States, just to give you for comparison purposes, uh, we address them two ways. We address them at, at, at the personal level, what we refer to as personal conflicts of interest or PCIs. Uh, when, you know, for example, uh, if I am, for example, a high ranking official in the Air Force and I'm negotiating employment with a large defense contractor um, and meanwhile giving them secret deals um, uh, on, uh, on their contracting opportunities, that's a very, very famous case in the United States. Um, by the way, um, any of my students that are on this would, would nod their head right now. Um, uh, that would be uh, an issue. So, so we deal with it at, um, for personal reasons, we deal with it at a criminal level, uh, we deal with it at a kind of a, a civil level, um, and then we deal with it at uh, an, an ethical uh, level. We also deal with it within our own procurement regulations. So there are multiple overlapping um, legal uh, rules that apply depending on uh, the particular person's role uh, within the procurement process or just the government in general. Um, we also deal with it from an organizational conflict of interest standpoint, um, and that is designed to, again, prevent conflicts of interest when, for example, example, um, I am a contractor and I've assisted the government uh, in designing a procurement, I could then no, not have a particular component or division of me, uh, you know, uh, my company compete for that particular procurement. Or um, a certain high profile example I just recently testified about in Congress, um, uh, you couldn't, uh, you know, for example, advise the government on how to, uh, you know, regulate um, or, or handle a certain licensing process and then go ahead and, and the other, you know, take a contract with the companies that are then applying for those licenses because they'd be concerned about bias. So we do it in a fairly comprehensive uh, way. PCIs have often been viewed with a bit more suspicion um, in, in the United States, more of an issue uh, associated with um, I don't want to say criminality, um, but it's it's viewed more uh, as an improper business practice. Organizational conflicts, which to me are no less nefarious, um, have often been almost a check the box qualification aspect in the United States system, even though it also has um, serious uh, conflict issues. Um, so we deal with them differently. Um, but you know, look, I think the idea of taking steps forward and is 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 a good one, um, but it is full of traps and exceptions and it's a complicated area. So it will be interesting to see how the UK navigates it. Yeah, the, uh, Chris. just picking up on, on Jessica's point regarding conflating personal and organizational conflicts of interest. This is something that she and I struggle a lot with when we're, when we're, when we're talking about anti-corruption. Why do we deal with organizational conflicts of interest and personal conflicts of interest in such a disparate way? Personal conflicts of interest here would typically lead to years of imprisonment. Organizational conflicts of interest, is, as Jessica points out, can be a check the box exercise, even though they can undermine a, a, a procurement just as much. Why is it that we deal with them so differently? It probably goes back to agency theory and the idea that you know, at the end of the day, the law is about setting up monitoring mechanisms where the monitoring fails within the system. And with personal conflicts of interest, personal conflicts of interest are relatively easy to hide. A bribe is a form of a, a personal conflict of interest, and it's relatively easy to hide that. An organizational conflict of interest is relatively easy to see because it has to do with the dynamics, the, the machinations of a large organization. And that may help explain why we have two separate regulatory systems and why the regulatory system for organizational conflicts of interest is so much more lenient than the personal conflict of interest system. We're, we're not sure, but we think that's a, a, a working, or at least I think that's a working explanation. And it, it, it points to the, the regulations, the implementing regulations in the United Kingdom sh probably should deal with the two types of conflicts of interest separately and differently. 
just before throwing it open, I mean, and uh, uh, asking shopping, um, does it matter that the definition is not really a definition? I mean, do, do you need a definition of conflicts of interest? There's there's a purported definition of conflict of interest, but I think it's just a circular roundabout. Um, and maybe it doesn't matter because maybe a conflict of interest is just something like, like an elephant. You know it when you see it, and that's what you're supposed to understand. It, it's a flexible, it's a flexible contextual context. And I, that, but I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, maybe Shopper, do you want to do you want to start on that and start? Do you comment first, and then and then maybe you can come back. Um, yes, sure. Thanks. Okay, so I think I, I would prefer having like a clear definition. Otherwise, the the categories of what could be a conflict could be too broad um, from, from my point of view. So I think it would have been, it would have made more sense if there was some kind of indication as to when a conflict will arise as opposed to what, what they have now. Um, so that's one thing I agree with Jessica that actually having it in the bill is good and you know addressing it head on is good. But again, it suffers from the same kind of, of challenges as the other aspects of the, of the bill we've been talking about, the circularity and the confusion that is inherent in the provisions. For me, the other challenge that I found was in um, in section 76, where they talk about having conflicts of, of interest assessments. And they say that, that the, the contracting authorities should have these assessments before they put um, out a, a, a tender advertisement. Um, and I thought that was quite odd because I was thinking, OK, so if I don't know who the suppliers coming to tender are, then how will I know if I have a conflict or not. So it seems, um, I don't know, a strange point in time to be doing an assessment when you don't know whether there will be such a conflict. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe, I mean, Michael is shaking his head. Maybe Michael has an answer <laughs> um, to that. But I think, so on one hand, it's good to be there. Um, but again, it's going to be problematic because we don't have def we don't have definitions. We don't know what the scope is going to be. Um, and the way to mitigate these is also going to be um, because it's left in it's left in the hands of the supplier to actually address it, um, so I, I felt that it, just the way it's it's been implemented is is a bit strange to me. Well, Shope, uh, just to follow up, and Michael, maybe you can provide some clarity. D does this? How does this work with, if at all, um, existing regulations or requirements within the UK that deal with um, government officials? So, for example. You know, if I'm a government official, and that doesn't matter who I am, I could be doing procurement, I could not be doing procurement, I'm bound by certain ethics requirements that end a criminal statute that prohibit conflicts of interest. Um, one deals with criminal conflicts of interest and one deals with uh, a lesser standard of impartiality. I don't want to say lesser standard, but it's a lower threshold. It's, it's more of an ethics regulation. And those are, you still have to comply with those. And then we have sub supplemental regulations that uh, under the procurement that, that deal with it for specifically for procurement officials. And then we have obligations within the FAR, which really speak to officials, again, the contracting officials. So I guess my, my question is like, how, do you have that? And does this effectively buttress that with an additional requirement for the suppliers? Um, for example, our organizational conflicts of interest, the onus is the our regulations speak to what the contracting officer has to do to basically like, you know, neutralize or mitigate these potential conflicts or eliminate them. But we rely then on contracting provisions in, in the United States to have the companies themselves disclose these potential. Um, and failure to do so could be, you know, lead determination, you know, fraud, fraud case. But for the personal conflicts of interest, it, it's a system, meaning like you've got ethics restrictions and then it's buttressed by some of the stuff we find in our procurement regs. Is that, do you have that or is this it? Uh, let me, I'll let others chip in in a moment, um, as I'm sure I won't give a comprehensive answer. It's not the case that this is it but there is no broad comprehensive answer to your question. Um, if you're, for example, local, local, authority, offer, local authority offers officers are subject to actually quite a lot of legislative controls in the way of these things. There's lots and lots of rules about what senior officers of, officers of local authorities can and can't do, uh, both in legislation and in, their, uh, and in their standing orders of the local authority. Um, Surprisingly, central government doesn't always apply to its own people the same rules that it does to local government. 
And so it's a bit harder to find those rules in, 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 in central government, although they do exist in, in different parts of the civil service rules. Um, the only place you will find in my recent recollection a really clear discussion of all of this slightly bizarrely, is in Queen's regulations, which govern the, govern the role of military, military and naval officers. Um, and there's quite a lot on that. Um, so poor old military, the military can get, it's much clearer what they can and can't do. What the, the background to all of this is there is a, 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 a rusty, dusty criminal offence, criminal misconduct in public office which has been the subject of a law commission inquiry. Um, and one of my proposals, when I finally get around to writing a chapter for someone on corruption at some point in the distant future, um, will be to look at that offence, because actually it seems to me that what we should really be doing is reinvigorating and picking up what the law commission has recently done on criminal misconduct in public office, uh, because that would, that would bring it all home, bring it all home. I've got a little anecdote about Samuel Pepys we'll come back to later. I, I'll try and keep it serious for the moment. Um, Sue, Gavin, did you want to chip on on that? Because I, I did you uh, maybe you have had something to add. To that. Yes, uh, I, I have uh, something to add. Um, so uh, when I, when we were looking at this, we thought, well, this is, um, you know, it's really good that there's a mandated assessment, conflict of interest assessment, and it's really good that they have to address perceived conflict of interest, you know, and that what might seem bad. But but then, you know, the key things that it hasn't done is um, it hasn't, the bill hasn't put into legislative effect some key recommendations that were made by an independent body after the Greensill scandal, which was an incredible, you know, really big, you know, UK scandal about supply chain finance and conflicts of interest. Uh, and key to those recommendations are A, that, you know, it's actually the conflict of interest isn't just about ministers or contracting authorities, it needs to be about the suppliers as well. So if you've left government and then you go and set up a company and then you start bidding for contracts with the department where you worked, you don't have to declare anything. That seems really bonkers to me. That's like a clear, you know, you might have really good contacts, you know what bid specifications are likely to be, you know, so it seems to me that that's a really major gap. The other thing that this um, independent review by Nigel Bourne recommended was that there should be sanctions. And there's nothing about sanctions for conflict of interest in, in, in this legislation. Um, I want to pick up a showpiece point about when the assessment takes place, because I was really confused by that. And I was thinking, that's crazy, but it does. Or this is why the bill is quite badly drafted and it's going to create lots of work for lawyers, is because then it actually says a tender notice or a transparency notice. So then you have to go back to the provisions to work out the transparency notice can be, I think it can be once the contract is awarded. So it isn't just before the tender, but I might be wrong, but I don't know, I'd be interested in other people's uh, perceptions on that. And then just finally, on your point, Michael, about the corruption in public office, um, I think one of the things that um, we've picked up from law enforcement bodies is you know, yes, a corruption in public office offence like the Law Commission has recommended it, it, you know, could be important, but one of the things from the EU Convention on Corruption, which we've always said, no, we're not going to do that, is actually trading and influence. And if you look at some of the kind of stuff coming out of the PPE scandals or any of the COVID loan contract scandals, actually, it was about tra people trading and influence to get contracts. So I'm just throwing that in there as a kind of another aspect of you know, actually, the laws are you know robust enough to actually capture um, you know people who do abuse their position to give mates contracts. So, yeah. Well, I, I think it was that the important point that um, corruption is something with a long history everywhere. Corruption is is contextual in every place. It's different. It is different in different different points in history in different societies. Um, and I wouldn't want to say that bribery doesn't happen here, but that's probably not our key problem. A bribery act offence is important, but not so much for the day-to-day -day management of what happens here. It would be more interesting if criminal misconduct in public office was, was of a broader was of a broader nature, um, and because that might cover a, a range of other other misdeeds, um, which, which people might want to look at without commenting on anything in particular. Um, is now a I can't see hands up at the moment. Would would that be a sensible time, Gavin, for you to, to just sum up 
Oh, no, they can sue to get together the 10 point improvement plan. Sorry, it's your, the, 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 we may have covered it all, but it may maybe worth just describing what this is and what you what 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 you want to do with it as it were and, and what 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 and a useful way of sweeping out points we haven't already covered yeah, do, you want to, do you want to kick off with it great so yes yeah, so, so the anti-corruption coalition is a kind of uh leading coalition of sort of public interest and public integrity you know, like advocates in the uk so transparency international sue's organization my organization those kind of uh uh, do-gooding kind of uh, champions for public integrity. So we collectively went through the um, procurement bill and drew out kind of looking really at that gap between the stated ambitions of the green paper, and which was you know, like a transformational kind of promise and what we saw in the bill. And we drew out kind of 10 point improvement plan based upon that. We have touched upon many of those already in this. So exactly, we touched upon the conflicts of interest provisions and making sure the board and recommendations are in there. We touched upon tightening, improving and clarifying dispute resolution, sorry, uh, the uh, debarment process and um, everything else. We have spoken about the transparency principle. I think we have spoken about the single rule book ambition and the need to stop what well, are potentially huge exemptions from those. And I'll just say a quick word on that. So, for example, the, the minister in charge of uh, the NHS may take the whole NHS regime out of um, the single rule book. There should be a kind of public interest test as to whether that is possible and why, why doing that would get better results for the UK taxpayer and for the stated objectives of the procurement regime by doing that. At the moment, that can be done relatively by, by administrative fire. So we are putting the exemptions should be subject to a clear public interest test of kind of explaining why the public interest is better served in relation to that. And as we've seen, there are many, many exemptions and there's many, many secondary regulations that are coming that could shape the regime. We want to make sure they all have these kind of underpinning duties of transparency and other things, which is why we refer to kind of regulatory dark matter, just the, the sheer weight of the regime may move over here because the many different kind of um, secondary instruments that may come in. A couple of things that we haven't really spoken about was um, within, I think it's section 88, there's this idea of like uh, digitization data or kind of, um, and so we think that should be a lot stronger and a lot clearer. In section six of the green paper, there was this idea of using end-to-end -end, uh, digitization and transparency for UK public contracting, using something called the open contracting data standard, which is a schema to like unlock and take the information from all the notices that will be drawn up under this, but convert them into machine readable open data, which then unlocks the power of like analysis and digitization to better drive kind of scrutiny and improvement of UK public contracts. Lots of other countries do this. You know, they have fully digitized end-to-end -end systems. They can have automatic red flags that detect things like conflict of interest, yeah, questionable contract awards, unusual patterns of sole sourcing with particular suppliers. It seems crazy not to have that opportunity in the UK. A large part of the um, impact assessment looks at the opportunities for that. The Cabinet Office are exploring that. It's an accepted and approved open data standard for the UK. It's just not clearly kind of situated and set up well in the bill, and we'd like to see that improved. Um, there's one about the duty to consider lots, which is really sensible. That's about breaking down large government contracts into smaller chunks for smaller businesses. That's great to have that duty to consider those. We would recommend there's a duty to consider planned procurement notices and pre-market engagement as well. So pre-market engagement is one of the main ways to talk to the, the smaller businesses in the voluntary sector. It's really important to kind of push um, contracting authorities to do that. It's a great way of talking to the marketplace, particularly if you want um, public procurement to achieve these other objectives like net zero um, carbon. We're going to have to have government buy things in fundamentally new ways. In order to do that, we're going to have to talk to the marketplace. So actually kind of having a duty to consider using those seems really sensible to us. And it's a missed opportunity at the moment because it's been made optional, which kind of means the good authorities will do it, the bad ones won't. And that seems a real shame and, and so on. We've spoken about um, commercial confidentiality. I think the only other thing I, I would cite, which is you already touched on, Michael, and, and um, and others is that dispute resolution. And there was an opportunity to potentially simplify that and put more um, emphasis on the kind of remedy of fixing the procurement before it goes wrong. And that really isn't addressed. It's completely missing from this bill. And that was a, a huge opportunity to do things differently that hasn't been taken. 
I, I don't really know what to do about that. I kind of defer to others, but it was just a great opportunity. Um, it seems a shame not to have um, kept the door open to think about smart ways of kind of addressing and fixing procurement yeah, before it goes wrong. So that, that don't have regulatory uncertainty, which obviously is a key thing to avoid. And of course, you don't want kind of timely and costly litigation slowing up actually delivering the public services. So long story short, there's a link there. And thank you very much um, for putting that in, Chris. Um, to our, our 10 point plan where we go in more detail into each of these. And some of them are relatively simple fixes. This isn't rocket science. I think there's, there's an option, particularly now it's in the House of Lords at the second reading today, to look at these things and put some amendments in that will better clarify the purpose of the bill and actually achieve those public interest objectives. See, thank you, Peter. Did you want to add to that? No, I think we've covered it all and we've discussed quite a lot. There's an important question from Caroline. Uh, I don't know. Do you want to pick up Caroline before you do? Before you pick up Caroline's question, can I just add an add an, add a sort of a gloss on your points, um, Gavin? Or the the, the points, Gavin, is um, really around one where your general point about limiting the exemptions. I think this is really really important. Um, it, it's easy easy to skip over them, and if I can just emphasise one 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 particular bugbear of mine. Um, these are uh, the exemptions. They're set out in in detail in Schedule Two to the um, to, 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 to the bill. Um, I didn't go over them to start with, and it's not because they're not important. Um, many will you'll read them and you'll think, well, that's all very familiar. Other than some rather fun, fun typos, um, they, all, they they all have ob obvious ancestors, um, but there's no acknowledgement of their ancestry and no clarity that they mean now what they used to mean. And I could go on about this for days, but I'm gonna pick on one, which I think is really important when it comes to the integrity of life, public life, land and buildings. Um, this is a small country, land is at a premium. And the, as we all know, and it's very well set out in recent books, it's like, like the book, A New Enclosure by Chris, um, his name is starting to say, A New Enclosure, it was worth reading. The, the way in which public land has been abused and misused as a vehicle for, um, let me call them interesting transactions, uh, many, some of which have got into the public domain, is, is, is really crucial. And um, it may seem obvious to us what the land and buildings exemption means because we've all done EU, seen the EU law cases and we know what it does and doesn't mean. But I can well see how there might be arguments made that this somehow takes all land transactions out of scope. And this would be a this would be a, a really major issue mm -hmm. because certainly at the local government level, an awful lot of the interesting goings on are around attempts to avoid competition in the deployment of land when it's being directed towards let's just call them local businessmen for the for, for want of a term um, and i think you know we, we really need to think a bit about it's not just enough to cap it's not enough to, to carry over language um in the context of being all brexit and saying well words words mean what they mean and they don't mean what they used to mean because we've abandoned europe well, do you, if you mean that, you need to be much clearer because words are the words are not inherently clear. They're only inherently clear to lawyers because we've got 30, 40 years of case law explaining them. And if we're to abandon that case law, some of this stuff is really and it, and it opens up some quite some quite serious um, intrusions into the integrity of public life in this country. I think. <coughs> Sorry, uh, rant over. I'll, do, you want, do, you want, do you want to pick up maybe? Any other points, but Caroline's question as well is an interesting one. Yeah, no, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think what what Caroline Nicholas, um, and for those of you not maybe familiar with her, she's um, the procurement lawyer at the UNC trial and and knows the UNC trial model law inside out. Um, she, she's raised a few points that I think are worth um, just just broadcasting. So the the first one is that. Um, from from an anti-corruption perspective, it's very important for the procurement legislation to to facilitate prevention, and and that would be required by the United Nations um, Convention on um, Anti-Corruption, 
I think the the Junkak, I don't know the full name, um, Article Nine, and and I think my my reaction to that first point that she raises about prevention is actually the bill, rather than preventing corruption, I think it, it facilitates it to the extent that it increases flexibility. I think uh, uh, there is an unavoidable tension between flexibility, discretion, and corruption, in that the more flexibility and space for discretion, the, the more space for corruption. So you need to do that in a very controlled setting where you have all the checks and balances. For the reasons that we were discussing earlier, conflicts of interest not being particularly tight, exclusions not being particularly tight, it doesn't look like there's a lot of, 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 of checks and balances. Um, and, and in practice, I think we see every day, for example, that revolving doors in the UK act in a way that is not in line with what the rules say they should be doing. They just, the practice is much more flexible. So, so I think that, that there is an opening for corruption that is problematic. And if I can be a bit cynical, if, if this legislation was not being proposed by the UK, but it was being proposed by choose your less reputable jurisdiction, then we would all be much more critical about the rules than, than we maybe are. And, and I think that's, that's something worth stressing. And I, I, I think that Caroline probably um, would agree. But, but the, the other point that she raises that is also very important is that the bill as presented would not meet the requirements of the UNC trial model law. And, and one of the things that some commentators have raised, and I, I mentioned that already in the Green Paper, is that it's a bit strange for the UK, and it has the opportunity to write the rule book from scratch, not to look at the UNCTRAL model law and say, what we're doing maps into the UNCTRAL model law in this or that manner, because the UNCTRAL model law is really an open and flexible menu of choices. You don't have to adopt everything within it. You can just pick and choose. So it, it would have allowed to say, well, we, we follow the UNCTRAL model law and all these things. And here's where we create this you know, super complicated, comp competitive, flexible procedure because we, we have sort of promised to, and otherwise it would be embarrassing if we don't develop it now. But th that is not that. And maybe the reason why there is not a link in the UNCTRAL model law is, is for reasons like Caroline indicates. For example, the requirements to comply with transparency and competition principles from the beginning and to make sure that the, the rules of the game, so to speak, are clear from the beginning are not met by the procurement bill. The, the, the specific issue that she raises is with clauses 23 and 22, which allow the contracting authority to modify the requirements in the procurement uh, documents as they go. And, and what is missing in particular is an obligation to meet a specific time limit to republish the documents as amended in a way that allows everyone to look at the documents and then make a fresh decision on whether to participate or not. The, the issue would be, imagine a small and medium enterprise that doesn't have endless time to consider procurement documents. They look at the procurement documents as published, they find some requirement they don't meet, decide not to tender. That requirement is dropped down the line, but this is only published maybe a few weeks later when there's only two or three days left to participate. That SME will effectively have been barred from the competition just because of the timing of things. That, that doesn't seem great. Um, so it's, and, and, and I'm sure we would find lots more examples if we start combing the bill with that sort of um, magnifying glass. So, so I, th this is, I guess, just to stress that that that's another element that makes assessing the bill very difficult because having so many things pushed down to the dark matter um, and and secondary legislation, it's also very difficult to now raise challenges to the government, basically saying you have not included this in the legislation because I could say, oh well, there is this little hook where we will hang it from in the non-statutory guidance that is going to follow the statutory guidance is going to follow the secondary legislation. So wait until July 2023 and you will see it then. Um, I, 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 th I think this is not the best way to regulate and I have tried to say that um, as best as I could in my, in my working paper. But, but what I think this demonstrates is that going back to the issue of the 350 regulations, the issue of the single rule book, if you're going to have a single rule book that to have a sense of how something works is going to require you to read through four different levels of materials, which are going to be very bulky and which could contradict each other, not having the overarching principles, not having the overarching link to best practices, not having the overarching link to the model law makes things quite messy. Um, so so th 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 there you go. Uh, I'm, I'm my optimistic self, and I think <laughs> I will just keep the negativity to a minimum for, for the rest of the event. Um, There's a list of other questions you had. 
Uh, but, but I think they're up there. I mean, I don't. I think we probably covered. If this is anything else we wanted to encourage you, encourage I, your positivity. I, 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 on. I think here the the only one would be to um, maybe stress a point that that Gavin and I have been discussing for a bit, which is that the problem with committing to OCDS, for example, to try to make things more transparent, even if it's not in the clauses, and clause 88 would have to change a bit for that. But committing to that is not going to allow for automating things like red flags in itself when, when the information that you're going to be publish, publishing is based on procedures that are make your own, because it's a competitive, flexible procedure, where timings are not necessarily set, and where there's lots of discretion in the underlying decisions. Because, for example, if, if you were to say there's a red flag every time that the contracting authority conducts negotiations with a single operator, all of a sudden you may find that all of the competitive flexible procedures have the red flag. And then that red flag becomes meaningless because it doesn't allow you to distinguish. Um, so, so it's gonna make it much more difficult to make sense of the data where the data is based on a discretion that could be corrupt or could be for a good reason. So, so, so that's, that's the, the, the final point to, to increase here to say, I mean, P P Pedro Tellez, I think was the first one to, to spot in the green paper. This is not very automation friendly. He has a, a blog post um, that I can put in the, in the chat later. And, and I think this is carrying through the legislation. We, we're gonna end up with, with a set of legislation that because of the multi-layer and multiple discretion points is gonna be very difficult to code for automation in terms of red flags. So, so that would be another thing that would worry me because even if we get the transparency, whether whether it would just be lots of noise or something meaningful, it, it becomes for everyone to see. Um, so yeah. I, I, Did you want to pick up those points? Because it does sort of get into your wheelhouse, as they say. Yes, I mean, obviously you can look at what, what are the relevant red flags in a highly discretionary regime. I think I just, I'd emphasize, the value is just some data compared to what exists at the moment, where the government as I said, doesn't know what happened to Carillion, right? How many contracts you have and what your level of exposure is. So if the notices are structured correctly, and particularly kind of they're gathering for the first time coherent information on performance, that's a very valuable data set. So I think one of the key pushbacks on transparency is that if it's extractive transparency, where it just involves poor, already hardworking people um, having to code it into another system, that's going to be real pain. So how do we make sure these notices are like born digital, that all the e-sending and e-procurement platforms that are in the UK, which are all quite fragmented, are all talking the same language. That's the value of a common schema to at least begin to collect that information together. And then you've got the beginnings of a single digital register you can extract value from and feed it back to the authority. Say, hey, listen, here's your dashboard of your key contracts. Here's where you're doing things. Within your department, you're using lots Lots of flexible discretionary procedures. You're not necessarily looking at them equally. Some you're getting great performance from, some you're not. That's probably an opportunity for retraining. And then I guess we're saying there's this idea in the green paper of a procurement review unit that would look at like a systematic misapplication of rules. That's there's an a option for the Secretary of State to have the power to do that, but it's not clearly scoped out in the bill. So I think that's another again missing opportunity. Wherever we've seen the sustained dr driven performance of like, yeah, better procurement it tends to be driven by a procurement you know, review unit or authority that's got that kind of detailed expertise and also can therefore deal with conflicts of interest and all these other things and, and give better and clear rulings on them. So there's a lot of value there. Um, it just needs to be thought through and made consistent, but uh, your points are excellently made. Um, let's just, in the last couple of minutes, uh, we should just talk a little bit about remedies. We're not, it's, this isn't, um, it's all, they're always important, um, and I'm not going to talk about the procurement. The, just picking up Gavin's last point, the the the, the bill tantalises us with the prospect of a sort of bifurcated remed, remedial system with a sort of re reprint of the existing court-based system driven by bid challenges. <clears throat> And something called the procurement review service, I think it's called now. I can't remember. I think it's PRS, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so. Is that just a grown-up version of the mystery shopper? I know we're not supposed to call it that anymore, but or is it something new and different? Um, can't really tell from the bill. Um, it, it could be very important because certainly, and I'm go, go, going be far beyond the topic of the topics we've been talking about today, when we're talking about social and environmental stuff, if you want to look at a department or a local authority or whoever 
that has been systematically ignoring social or environmental matters and needs to change their approach. That is probably the most effective way of dealing with it, rather than dealing it on a case by case basis. And a point I've made in many fora is that bidders on the whole don't care about this stuff. Um, they will bid to whatever frame of reference you give them, which is fine. I mean, that's but if you tell them that that's, those are the rules, they'll bid to them. You're not going to get lots of challenges. You'll get some, but you won't get lots of challenges sort of telling local authorities to up their game in, in whatever um, policy area that, that might be. So, but that's really not the issue here, I suspect. Uh, in the sorts of things we've been talking about, we're talking about the, the, the case-driven remedies um, whether it's <clears throat> the case being a tender, a tender or exclusion, or the exclusion of a bid, or a decision to take you on or off a debarment. We've talked a bit about the debarment appeals. Um, and maybe if we can just... Uh, but it, can I pick yeah, you please. up on, on something? Yeah. So when we look at the uh, system on recommendations, so it's basically clauses 96 and the following, but it looks like this procurement review unit, even if it's not named like that, could, could issue recommendations. But, but there are two things here. The one is, if they investigate a specific case, the recommendations under paragraph three of clause 97 cannot relate to how the contracting authority is trying to achieve the procurement objectives, how they are or not taking into account the procurement policy statement, or how they're exercising a specific discretion. So, so left. what's left? That's the first one. The, the, the second one is then they're supposed to issue general guidance in clause 98. And, and this just sounds like university management and, and, and just allow me this rant. When, when somebody doesn't do something in a university, uh, an academic, and it's difficult to get us to do anything that the administrators want us to do, instead of telling Albert, you haven't marked in time, you have to meet the deadlines. What they do is they issue a notice to everyone saying everyone has to meet the deadlines, which of course Albert is gonna ignore because he doesn't look into those guidance. So we, we're creating the same system here. Instead of telling the specific contracting authority, you're not being green, you're not being social, or you're abusing the possibility of being social or whatever we want to tell them, we're gonna issue a guidance that the authority is gonna ignore and everybody else is gonna freak out about it. So it, it's just a strange system of recommending. And, and I, I'm, I'm not sure what the remit of, of, of these recommendations is going to be, but I'm, I'm, I'm a bit worried about them. Okay, my enthusiasm is deflated. Treat them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Albert. Um, court, court decisions. Um, there are a number of slides on... Um, come in. Just, do, we, do we have... It's coming in for, uh, the duties, duties, duties. There we are. There we are, duties. Um, a couple of questions. There have been a couple of questions in the chat that have gone along on this, and I'm, we're not going to have time to sort of go through this in, in great detail. Um, just working backwards, Clause 94 provides for what are called set aside conditions, and broadly speaking, it's the, it's the um, if I call it first ground in a first and second ground in effectiveness, it's not quite that, but it's the sorts of things where. Um, someone has deliberately avoided doing something they ought to have done in terms of in terms of transparent in terms of publishing a notice or something and there the, the the trigger question is you were denied an opportunity to seek a remedy well you were denied an opportunity to seek a remedy because you weren't told the thing was happening at all that's I think a special case all the other remedy provisions start with language along the lines of, if the court is satisfied that the decision made breached the duty referred to in section 89. So that's post-contractual remedies like damages, pre-contractual remedies like setting aside the, 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 the bid process and starting again, um, all the suspension stuff. The, the trigger question is always a breach of, um, of the duty in clause 89, which is why um, we put this up because the duty in 89 um, is just a duty to comply with everything that's above. Now, that's sort of the same as, as what it is today, but, but what, it, what it is today includes EU ob and the EU obligation. Now, you may say, well, that doesn't matter because the key obligations, they've been reworded unhelpfully, but they are all there. But it doesn't, I don't think, answer my question as to what 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 is the test for deciding that you failed to comply if you failed to comply 
by exercising your discretion in the 101 different ways in which this regime invites you to exercise a discretion. Um, I was delighted to see that we didn't have any reference to sufficiently serious breaches in this provision, but I rather fear that sufficiently serious breaches and all of that nonsense will come beetling back in in, our, in reinterpreting clause 89.1 because it'll say, well, you're not in breach of your duty if it isn't really a serious, if, as, long as, as long as you can clothe yourself in discretion. It goes back to this point about public and private law breaches and all of that. And I think this really needs to be thought through for all sorts of reasons about how to make this work. Um, a further point which Chris has made to me on a couple of occasions, and Chris, you'll raise your hand, so maybe you're going to make the point. Chris, do you want to make the hand, make your point? No, just the, the, with, with regards to um, paragraph two, this is astounding because it's depriving standing to anyone from any, any vendor from that's not from the United Kingdom or not from a treaty nation. Um, there are two basic purposes that we believe in a to a to a bid, bid protest or bid challenge system. One we talked about before, which is it's a uh, it's a red flag system so that you know where there are failures in the procurement. The other part is it's it's intended to um, address injuries to vendors and therefore to reinforce the integrity of the system and to ensure that there's adequate competition in the system. So it's a procurement, it's a management tool, and it's also a remedy system to, to, to remedy wrongs uh, for various reasons. Um, it, the fact that someone, that a vendor, for example, would come from, let's say, India, which is probably not a treaty state supplier, unless they're a member of a, a bilateral arrangement with the United Kingdom that I'm not aware of. But in our system, India wouldn't be because they're not a member of the GPA. The fact that they're from India has nothing to do with those two purposes. They may have a very valid criticism of a particular procurement. It's very important to give them standing in order for the system to self-correct. Uh, this, this, this is a radical, radical narrowing of standing. Um, and it, it's really at odds with with what the, norm, the norms are internationally. Well, okay. well sorry, I say, Chris, it's, it's not a radical narrowing in that it reflects the EU law position um, in that it's no more or less than what EU law always required. And in the UK, at least, not in some other member states, in the UK, on the whole, it doesn't matter much because on the whole, most, in, I mean, lots and lots and lots of Indian companies sell stuff to the UK government. Um, no one does it through an Indian company. Anyone, anyone trading with the UK government trades through a UK company. And so it costs, what, I don't know how much does it cost to set up. It, someone probably knows how much it costs to, to, to buy an off-the-shelf company now. 12 quid. 12 quid, there we are. For 12 quid, you are a UK <laughs> supplier. Um, but, but Michael, the problem here is that this, the working assumption, this is a, it's crazy, you're taking a European Union assumption, which is that remedies are really about ensuring adequate trade, and you're bringing it into a post-Brexit UK law. Absolutely. That's what's crazy. Well, that's what I said. Again, read my read my evidence to the House of Lords twelve months ago. The original the original sin was to see trade as the most important goal of all of this. I'm not saying it's not a goal, but but if you frame everything around trade, this is where you end up. And of course, it it, it, it becomes it becomes all part of. We must be careful not to. I I don't know what lies behind this. I guess it could be. I wouldn't be. I'm fear I wouldn't be surprised if it is as narrow as. We must be careful not to offer the world any more than they got from us when we were in the EU. Yeah, I think I think that's part of that. But the other thing is this this strange position on damages, right? So if, if you look at the green paper, the green paper wanted to cap the damages. Then it was made clear in the consultation that the premises why they considered there was an, an excessive risk of damages was flawed. So they dropped it. But then we still have a very restrictive approach to remedies which are based on civil litigation, like Michael was explaining. So it's a private law remedy. So, but the, the one thing that I find most difficult to understand and doesn't completely explain this rationality of not giving the world more than we had under EU law, is that if you look at clause 82.1, it says that a contracting authority cannot discriminate either below threshold procurement, international organization procurement, or a procurement against a treaty supplier, right? So we're extending it beyond yeah. EU and GPA by going to below threshold and international organizations. But then we say in clause 89.5 that that duty below thresholds or in international organization um, 
based procurement is not amenable to enforcement in civil proceedings. So we give well, you a right, you will never. This part. Sure. So what the, okay. So it's so interesting. So, so, review. so you go to judicial review. So that's that's not well, oh, no, absolutely. But, but it, it does point to the issue of the fear of damages. Yes. Because you would not get damages in the judicial yeah. review. Yeah. That's bonkers. And the answer to all, all, again is that it is the fact that you don't have a remedy here doesn't mean you don't have any remedy because if you don't have a remedy here, you may have a remedy in a public still have a public law remedy. I mean, this is just sorry, I don't want to, we're now disappearing down a rabbit hole of, of the chaos of English civil procedure, um, which the in, in a very English sort of way have just been fixed by the courts within the EU context, more or less, and we so that it didn't really matter. And all of that is now being reopened again. Right. Oh. Um, so, I mean, I don't think the, the situation is as, is as dire as you present it, Chris, but that's not that's not a, a recommendation for this as an approach. That's just it's it's been a it's been a topic. The areas where it has been a problem is not as it happens with, with Indian suppliers. There have been a few Chinese suppliers that have not wanted to incorporate in the UK. And I think part of the issue has been sort of well, if they don't want to incorporate in the UK what's you know what's going on and in the area of defense it's been a problem historically with defense and sort of foreign foreign office procurements particularly defense where you've got companies supplying to the to the uk government once upon a time for example at bagram air force base um though obviously you wouldn't necessarily incorporate in the uk if you were selling kit to the to the air force at bagram air force base um or whatever the modern equivalent would be um, but that is, uh, so I'm not saying it's not a problem, it's just not been a huge problem. I just want to flag something for the audience, Michael, because it, it, with regards to the references to international organizations, the references to international organizations seems, you know, obscure, arcane, what are, why, why are we talking about those? But what, the, what emerged during the pandemic, what became very clear is, is, is there's a true international crisis, a pandemic, a nuclear war that the, the governments re, re respond in a very aggressive way to close borders for political reasons. The only organizations that can get, across, get around those export controls are the international organizations. For example, the UN organizations will have the legal authority to bypass export controls. And in the event of a future crisis, a nuclear war or another pandemic, the, the procurements involving those international organizations could turn out to be really, really important. And so integrating them into the fabric of the British law on how you approach things like remedies, very important because that, that will be a time of crisis. And in the bill though, is that special provision for the Secretary of State to declare a kind of mm. public emergency, I find the exact language that's used allows for special kind of procedures to be used. And so there's a, uh, yeah, the checks and balances that are interesting and yeah, like what's the parliamentary scrutiny and the use of that power, particularly when that power stops as well. Yeah. Um, right, how are we doing? Um, I think we're running out of time. Anyone? Wanted to wrap up with any final thoughts? Um, yeah, Michael, why why does the um, why does the damages carry into the new law? We we we've never understood that in the UK system. In the US system, damages basically don't exist. You you get your maybe you get your bid and proposal costs, maybe you get a party of attorneys fees, but there's no real prospect of real damages. Um, the real what, the reason people bring bid challenges is because. They want to get the contract. Um, it, it's only in systems that are distorted. Like, uh, um, I won't name the country, but it's an authoritarian country. And in that that country, the lawyers actually argue, the government lawyers argue in favor of heavy damages because the vendors are afraid of their government. They won't bring a challenge unless they have the enticement of a of, of damages. But in in your country, that's not necessary. Why is it that you, the, the new law carries forward the damages when they seem to be so disruptive in terms of making people think the wrong way about bid challenges? Why do you still have damages? Uh, I don't know. I'm on record as saying that we should have stuck with the bid, cap, bid cost cap. Uh, I think all I can refer you to is the relevant language. I don't have the reference to hand in the response to the consultation where they changed their mind on that, where they gave... I don't think they really gave an explanation, but it was referred to. I don't know. Um, it's puzzling. 
Um, I th because as, as I've said in, I keep referring, I keep thinking of this, the, that this article will die and no one will ever have to refer to it again, but it keeps, its relevance keeps returning. As I've said in more than one, in more than one article though, um, the, um, the existence of the damages makes it, it, it lets the court off the hook it, when it comes to interim relief. And the, it gives the court the opportunity of saying, well, damages was plainly an adequate remedy. I don't need to, I don't need to, to stop this bid process. I don't need to set aside the award decision because damages will, will, let, will, will deal with this at the trial. Um, but the statute, the statute would impose an automatic suspension. The court would have to, the presumption runs towards the suspension. The court would have to lift the suspension. Uh, well, no, I don't, I'm not sure there is a presumption. Okay. It, it, it looks, now only says the court must have regard to amongst other things and any other matters that the court considers appropriate. Well, the things that the court will consider appropriate will be a whole load of, and it includes damages and adequate remedy for the claimant. And that's now explicitly in there. That would mean something very different if damages were, were capped at bid costs. Yeah. Indeed, it would probably not be possible to say as a matter of English law that damages are an adequate remedy ever if they were capped at bid costs. Uh, so as uh, I, if, if I can just close in comments here um, to remark on two things um, uh, that's really struck me as an American looking at this. One is the, con the contract administration provisions that are tucked at the back of the bill. Um, those are an important step forward in integrating both contract formation and contract administration. Uh, that's something we've been talking about for years in the European Union, and I think the UK is making very, very good steps forward in that regard. Um, the other thing is the trade aspects. Um, the, the, as you know, in the European Union, the international procurement instrument has been percolating for some time and would give procuring entities across the European Union the right to discriminate against foreign vendors if, if for example, they, the, their home countries weren't, um, weren't being cooperative in trade negotiations. But it's really been something that, that has, has been stumbled along through the years, partly because of opposition from the United Kingdom. Extraordinarily, this new bill would just allow contracting authorities to exclude contractors from treaty states and the UK. It's just, it's, it's brutally isolationist. And I think that that, that, that is a mistake. And in the, in the United States, as we've discussed, the, the United States moved towards onshoring after the pandemic of critical supplies. The Biden administration has a major initiative in that regard. And then boom, we're in the middle of an infant formula crisis here. We have very heavy, very high barriers to entry for infant formula here in the United States, partly due to government procurement policies, and we have a huge shortage here. So it turns out that setting up high barriers to trade and procurement can be very destructive. It can mean that there can be very severe shortages. It's exactly the opposite of the basic science, the supply chain science of supply, and reg supply chain resilience, setting up those barriers. So I have to say that the international trade provisions, which are discussed in other slides, here that are posted on the website, the international trade provisions, the locking off of the UK market is surprising and, and disheartening. Uh, yeah, okay. um, I wouldn't read too much into those particular provisions, Chris, in the sense that I suspect they're just, um, uh, they're sort of weird artifacts uh, in that um, one major factor is that, as a matter of fact, we simply do not have the domestic supply to meet our public sector demand, given the structure of our economy. So um, even if we wanted to do the sort of onshoring that the Biden administration has talked about, it just ain't happening. Um, so in a sense, it's a sort of, <laughs> it, it, it's a, it, it's a rhetorical flourish with very little practical meaning, I think. Um, it is now the time we said we would finish, so we probably should finish. Thank you so much to everyone, to Gavin, Sue, Albert, here, in, to Shoppy, Jessica, Chris, out there. Um, thank you to all of you for great questions. Sorry, we didn't quite get the, the we didn't, we hope to be able to bring you in and out, but that didn't quite work. Thank you particularly to Gloria Stanganelli, who's been 
keeping looking after us and trying to keep us to keep up with us all the way through. Thanks for all of her help. Thank you, everyone. Home abroad. Have a have a beautiful day. It's now the sun is now out. The cloud is gone, and as a result, as I promised you, Chris, this room gets really hot once the sun comes out. So we're going to go and have a drink. Thank you very much. Bye.